four hours of Impact, and I watched an hour of ECW. And the show that did a better job building intrigue for TNA was actually ECW. Because Tommy Dreamer retired, and he's going to Impact. And they gave him such a great send-off that I began thinking in my mind, what could this man possibly do on Impact that could possibly top this? And I was intrigued. Whereas when Impact went off the air, all I could think was, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> I was thinking, thank God. I mean, this, this, this was like, we've, we've talked a lot about a lot of stupid things that TNA has done in the last however many years it's been since they've been in business. I can't exactly call the New Year's Eve show a stupid show, but the whole situation is rife with stupidity. You chose January 4th, the Monday after two straight holidays, okay? This is a, a profound level of, of idiocy. Like, the, no one had a calendar in the TNA offices. I mean, they're in Nashville. Did they just have an old farmer's almanac from 10 years ago and it was not up to date? How do you schedule a show for January 4th and not realize that your show is on a Thursday and the two Thursdays prior to January 4th are Christmas Eve and Impact? I mean, this is a monumental fuck-up on their part. So with that said, what do they air on on New Year's Eve? A woman's tournament, which was largely shit. The show ended with the announcement of two matches for the January 4th Impact, which they're calling the most important impact of all time. Now, keep in mind on Raw, they've announced Bret Hart returning to punch Vince McMahon. DX versus The Big Show and Chris Jericho for the undisputed tag team titles in what will probably be a title change. And what was on the last pay-per-view, a top match, Randy Orton versus Kofi Kingston. And more. At the end of a four-hour impact, the four-hour go-home show to January 4th, we know that we're going to see Sarita and Taylor Wilde against Awesome Kong and Hamada for the knockout tag team titles, and ODB versus Tara for the women's singles title. That is literally all we know, mm -hmm. except that Hulk Hogan is going to be and there. Hulk Hogan will be there. That is all. <laughs> they did not mention any other names. They did not mention any other matches. They did not mention anything. They showed Hulk Hogan talking about it. They showed Dixie Carter talking about it. And there was all stuff we'd seen before. Yes. They, they, they recapped promos. This show was over, and I just could not believe my eyes. Like, this show ended, and there is no momentum going to their supposed most important show of all time. I mean, none at all. I look on the, on the website, and we had that poll. What do you think the rating is going to be? for the January 4th show. Did you happen to see this? Did you I see the latest poll? I saw there was a poll. I did not note the results. Keep in mind, this this uh, presumably people could have voted after the four-hour impact was over. What rating do you think it's going to do on Monday? 0.7 or less did get 18.2%, and 0.8 got 10.7%. So a full a quarter of the people or more think it's going to do a 0.8 or less. Meanwhile, you've still got 12.2% who believe this show is going to do a 1.7 or greater. There's zero chance of that. How? There is absolutely zero chance of that. This should not have been a poll. This should have been right in. Right into the program and please... You know what? I may do this Monday, actually. I may do this Monday. I may do open lines on Monday and ask... You, you can only call in if you think the show is going to do a 1.7 or greater. And I want you to tell me why you think this. Because this confuses me. I have no other way to explain it. It confuses me. I, I cannot think of a logical reason why anybody would think this show could possibly, much less 12.2% of the people that are reading our website. So that may be what we do Monday. But until then, let's talk about this uh, show, this uh, four-hour program of uh, Impact, which we have not got the rating for, and we will not get it until after January 4th. And honestly, I don't care. Well, I do, because I, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out if it's going to actually beat January 4th. This show? Yeah. God. Think. It's depressing. I, don't, I see your point. I see your point, and I think about it, but it's, it's depressing either way. There is a possibility that this could beat that. Now I, now, I thought it was a much better possibility when I wrote the newsletter. When I actually saw this show, and I realized what I was doing on New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. and I thought... Who on earth? I just thought, are there really, I mean, honest to God here, 
I realize that there are hundreds of millions of people in this country, but are there really 1.5 million people that would sit at home on New Year's Eve and watch this show for four hours? I do not believe that that is possible. I really don't. If it does, then we the human species may not last the decade. 1.5 million people sitting home on New Year's Eve and watching this show. I found it an unfathomable concept. So, they had brackets for the show, which was an improvement. That, in that, sense that, that, that is a thumbs up. They had brackets. But? The brackets. How do you even explain it? Take a take a side-by-side bracket. And we have one for King of the Board, actually. They, they made a bracket, and there's like 64 people competing. But they somehow made a very easy-to-understand graphic for King of the Board. Now, imagine if you took that graphic that has a right side and a left side, and you took the right side, and you lifted it up really high, and then you moved it over, mm-hmm. so it kind of was above and overlapping. Yeah, the other see, one. I, I could sort of tell what they were trying to do, because it, it would have worked if the bracket on the left and the bracket on the right had met in the middle. But there was just a bracket floating up top and a bracket floating on bottom, and nothing connected them at all. Yeah, so they screwed up the bracket, everyone. They can't do anything right. No. Uh, Hamada versus Madison Rain was the opener, and... I don't know what I don't know I don't know if they have something well they have something in Hamada obviously because when I was done watching this tournament I concluded she had to be the ber- best worker on this show because she had some some shockingly decent matches with girls that uh, suck that's being nice so she goes in there with Madison Rain and uh, it was rather absurd to see Madison Rain getting the heat on a Yako Amada but it happened. And it was, uh, it, it, it happened. So Amada makes a comeback, kicked her in the face, Amada driver, one, two, three, right girl advanced, and, uh, I was fine with this opening match, particularly in hindsight. <laughs> and yes, they worked very clunky together. They were, um, especially Madison, of course, was out of position for stuff. My favorite was where Hamada tried to do the rope walk, like the Undertaker, and then just jump off and do a lucha arm drag. And Madison just forgot to go. Yeah, just stood there. She just stood there. And it was one of those moments where I thought to myself again, this show is not live. Is this could... the match that happened? Oh, that is the match that happened. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, Hamada won. Thank God. Um, I have seen worse. This was not very good. Christy interviewed Tara. Or, to be more specific, Christy interviewed herself and Tara was Tara there. Tara was also there, yes. Speaking, yes. This, we've talked about it many times, but I think this may have been the best example of an interviewer no, trying to get themselves over. It gets better. I'll, I'll get into this. I got a big rant coming up, coming up here. I realize I've already broken my New Year's resolution, but I got something to say here in a while. So Tara plugged the match on uh, Monday, and uh, she did that, didn't she? She said, let's see here. I could have sworn she did. She, but then at the she end of the show. She vowed to remain champion. She said all the girls in the tournament were tough. She did vow to retain the title on Monday. Yeah. So there you go. Well, uh, there's two things here, actually. There is that one, because later they announced the title match on Monday. But here she vowed to retain the title on Monday night. She also said later on she would be introducing the top three TNA matches of 2009. That's right. And Christy asked her, well, give us a hint. What will those matches be? Earlier in the show, they had told us what the matches were. Yeah. So, as usual, no one in this company has any idea what the fuck is going on. So, keep in mind, by the way, that that Tara plugged her match on Monday against the winner of this tournament. So, anyway, she interviews her and that sort of thing. This uh, show. (laughs) There were two monumental out-of-continuity fuck-ups in this segment, and one of them I didn't even notice until right now. Yeah, well, there's another one coming up. So, Tracy faced ODB. And they're continuing with the storyline that Tracy has a birth defect, and so she's always at a major disadvantage in all of her matches. Now, keep in mind she wrestled for years and never had a problem problem. with it. (laughs) But now that it's been mentioned on commentary that she has a birth defect, which means she's had it since birth, now it affects her in all of her matches. So they had a match. It was poor. The comeback in particular was horrendous. I went to Buddy's school the other day, and uh, he's got some new students, as always, and they're doing tag matches and such, and they're all they're all new, so they're they're screw ups here and there, but not to this level. I mean, nobody had any idea where they were supposed to be during this comeback. Like Tracy was over by the ropes, and she was running at ODB, who was in a in the wrong spot, or vice versa. Just a, a horrendous, horrendous comeback. The crowd died, and ODB finally did something. I think a shoulder breaker hit the TKO for the pin. And 
terrible. This was when I really realized this is your go-home show for January 4th. <laughs> There's a point you in this. numbskulls. During Tracy's poor comeback where she tried to fire up the crowd by removing her shirt, stripping down her bra. Taz began discussing the giant breasts on both women, and uh, they had their poor match. Just get, that, that is relevant, by the way. I will, I will get back to this at the end of the show. But just remember, Tracy had moved her shirt during this. They had a poor match. ODB won. And here was where I thought, I have already seen enough of this tournament, and there are, I believe, five matches left. That sucks. Then we had Christy interviewing the beautiful people. Now, I know I've mentioned this before. I'm going to mention it again. WWE has dorks as announcers. They've got Todd Grisham. They've got Josh. These are completely average-looking guys who look a little nervous and out of place. And they interview larger-than-life superstars who next to them look even larger than life. You put Batista next to Josh Matthews, for example. He looks very big. Imagine if you had... And well-dressed and, yeah. Imagine if you had, say, uh, uh, Brad Pitt interviewing... Um, who would be a good example? Uh, Jimmy Wang Yang. Okay? Obviously, Jimmy Wang Yang would come off as the lesser star. When you have Todd Grisham interviewing Triple H, Triple H comes off as the bigger star. So, these idiots in TNA, they... I, I just... Sometimes you don't realize what you have until it's gone, as we've said before. Now, I always liked Lauren. I never buried Lauren. And I know that there were people that didn't like Lauren because she made goofy faces. And sometimes her faces were overly goofy. And sometimes I wondered why she was always gravely offended. But the point was, she did her job well. She looked good, you know, but she, she wasn't trying to overpower all the stars or anything like that. She went in there, and she did her thing, and the girls would insult her, and she would pout and be really sad and offended, and she looked like her feelings were hurt. And, and people didn't like that, but you people were wrong. Because now they've got Christy Hemi in the role. And Christy Hemi is there with all of the beautiful people. And they proceed to begin burying her like they always did with Lauren. Christy proceeds to completely blow them off. She smirks. She stands there. She gives them this bitchy look like she could not possibly care. She's not intimidated in any way. No. And keep in mind, this is not this is a girl that's never going to get in the ring with any of these girls. Right. She's, she is badly injured enough that she could never get in the ring. But she is not worried at all. Not only about any of these girls in particular, but about all three. No. This is a three-on-one bullying situation, and she is playing Batista. She is, is being tougher than all of these girls. What this did was completely kill any heat that they might have. They just, just killed the heat. And they talked about how... Uh, what's her name again? I just forgot her name. Madison? Ma no. The, uh, the one that's gone. Lauren. They talk about how oh, Lauren's yeah. gone because she slapped uh, Lacey and this and that. And that is how they wrote her out of the storyline, by the way. Uh, a one, at least they wrote her out. I'll give them that. But this was their explanation. And uh, Christy is just murdering these segments. Yeah. Murdering. Yeah. yeah. There would be one thing, too, if she was murdering them and entertaining. But, no, she's no, no more entertaining than the beautiful people themselves. So, at the end, this segment went forever and ever. All four women involved came off looking worse. And I, uh, it was very, very bad television. We had Velvet against Roxy. I expected worse. Velvet's getting better. Roxy made a comeback. The crowd did not care because the comeback, again, sucked. Second sucky comeback in a row. Roxy hit the voodoo drop, pinned her in like two minutes. And then Borash interviewed her, and she said she was so excited to advance to the next round, take out the trash like Velvet. Lacey jumped her from behind. And Taz all of a sudden explains that Lacey is one of the members of the Beautiful People. And I thought, do you people actually think that millions of new fans tuned in tonight on New Year's Eve? Why are you explaining this? <laughs> the only people watching this show are the people that, I mean, the hardest of the hardcore. Yeah. Taz is like, Lacey, one of the three members of the Beautiful People, alongside Velvet Sky and Madison Rain. And I was like, what? So there you go. I, this was, up to this point, the best match in the show, and that they didn't screw anything up. Velvet Sky, I believe, was actually wearing velvet during this match. That amused me. And that's really about it. It was short and inoffensive. They aired Angle versus Nigel from the pay-per-view. And had I watched this, I would have liked the show a hell of a lot more. But I already saw it. Did the Hulk Hogan promo hyping up the fourth. We had Awesome Kong against Daphne. And uh, this was poor. Kong won in about a minute. God bless it's Daphne. It's still way too long. Daphne is... 
She's really bad. She got offense in Awesome Kong. Uh, she's and, and not just a flurry at the beginning. She cut her off in the middle and did some stuff. And she's bad, and she's small, and there's no reason Awesome Kong should not be killing her in 30 seconds. So the wrestling was bad, and then Kong did the spot where she picks her up like a torture rack and then bends her in half and kicks her with her own head, or kicks her in the head with her own foot. And Mike Tanae described this as, it's like her foot is touching her head. <laughs> That's not what it's like, Mike. It's, it is. Her foot is touching her head. Then we had the interview with Sarita and Taylor Wilde. And they talked about how Sarita had just won the CMLL bodybuilding contest. And Chrissy throws this out just like she's constantly on the Cubs fans webpage getting these, <laughs> this information from Mexico. And they started talking about their title match on Monday. Yes, you see, the, the tag team champions are defending their belts on Monday. And who are they defending against, they explain? Well, we're defending our belts against Awesome Kong and Hamada. The tournament had not concluded. Awesome Kong and Hamada were both still in the tournament. So I guess we're supposed to think that there was a possibility that on January 4th, Hamada, for example, might wrestle twice in one night for both titles. Or these people have absolutely no idea what they're doing and they spoiled the finish of the tournament. I would go with the latter. I don't know, and I'll be honest, I don't care. You're I'm not just, wrong. I was amazed. You were not wrong about any of this. I just don't care. But yeah, why would you book a tournament, and when two people are still in the tournament, announce that they've got another match on the day that the finals are taking place? Because they're retarded. <laughs> it's just mind-boggling. So, then they had uh, Doug Williams and Brutus Magnus coming out to do commentary for Sarita and Taylor against April Hunter and Laura Lay. Now, this is an all-knockout show. Right. Anybody who watches this show on New Year's Eve is... A fan of the knockouts. For example, we've got a guy that calls Wrestling Observer Live every single Sunday, and he always asks a question about the girls. Because he's a huge fan. He's a huge fan. Jim in Virginia. He's our biggest fan of the knockouts. So the only people watching the show are people like Jim in Virginia. So they have this tag match, and they bring out these guys, and they do nothing but bury female wrestling for the entire match. Why would you do that? Well, I, I I don't know. I, I have no, I, I I have no explanation for what the British Invasion were doing here. They didn't plug anything. They didn't build to anything. They didn't get involved in the match. They had to let us know that what we were watching was bullshit for I, four hours. I I just know that at one point, referring to Lorelai and April Hunter, who were both making their TNA debuts, one of them, I believe Williams, said, they're not full-fledged knockouts at this point. They're more like mild concussions. Yes. That was the funniest line of commentary on the show in months and months and months. It was actually astounding because I was trying to think if there was any possible joke about concussions you could possibly make that would be funny. That was it. And I think this may be the only one you could possibly make. This was a good one. They are not knockouts. They are mild concussions. So they had the match, and it was fine. very short. Yeah. It was fine. And Babyfaces won. And, again, absolutely nothing to this show. I did. You know, I've... I've Seeing April Hunter's name around a lot. Was she like in WCW at the end? Uh, I think she was. Yeah, she was there at the end. But she and came out and she, she was, was a fitness model for years. If you ever bought a bodybuilding magazine, no. you would have seen her. Yeah, but I, I know she has. <laughs> you been, don't say. I know. I hate to break the news to you, but yeah, I, I know she has been involved in wrestling for a long time, and I've seen her name a lot. And she came out here, and she's very tall and very muscular and looks good. And for a little I could see her wrestling, she did okay. And I was like, how have you not been a bigger name to this point? I guess because she's doing fitness modeling instead. Well, she was. Wow. She's got her own website now that shows a little more, Vinny, if that's your thing. Well, I did look that up. It's not <laughs> hard to find. I am far more interested in that than the bodybuilding. And then we had the Joe Daniels AJ three-way, which also I should have watched, but we didn't. Oh, he needed a shitty promo, drank some liquor. We had Roxy and Hamada in a semifinal match. This may have been the best match on the show. And think about that, because Roxy... Roxy's no good. Oh, she looked bad here. The, the, the Especially since she's been working in Mexico. And yeah. they did Lucha, and uh, bad. The, 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 the beginning portion of this match, they were on completely different pages. They had no idea what the other was trying to do. I'm positive that you would have done better Lucha. Because we um, did Lucha spots a bit back in the day. And I was not this bad. No, you were not. No. So they had a match. So it, the good news is they got plenty of time here. Yes. And by the end, it was really good. 
I don't know what Roxy did. She got she broke her ankle in two places. I think the finish when she did a, a roll up, her left ankle was kind of at a weird angle. It was a, like a complete fluke. Like when you watch it, you think, how could a person possibly break their ankle doing that? But unfortunately, in wrestling that happens yeah. often. It's so usually, I presume that's what occurred. People, it seems, usually get hurt on these stupid shit. You once, I'm not saying this to make fun of you, you once got hurt doing a basement dropkick. Yeah. Brian Danielson got hurt taking a very basic tumble out of the ring. Yeah. It, it's the stupid shit. We had the Marine promos throughout the evening, which was hilarious. Just hilarious. We had ODB versus Kong. It was not horrible, except for the finish, which was uh, ODB finished off her bottle of Jack before the match. And then took the bottle and broke it over Kong's head for the finish. Now And pinned her. Yeah. I, I just had Rudy Charles on the show, and I wish I would have had him on the show after this match. Because I asked him about some of these things in TNA. Like, you know, it seems like sometimes there's rules and sometimes they're not. And he explained, for example, that if someone pulls the referee out of the ring, but then there's like a bunch of guys out there and the ref doesn't know who did it, he can't disqualify anybody. And I was like, huh, at least there's some internal logic to that. But I would have liked to have asked, it's one thing that the ref somehow missed ODB hitting Awesome Kong with a giant glass Jack Daniels bottle. That's one thing. But how did the ref not think something was amiss when he was counting amidst broken glass everywhere? That's my question. And this question was so obvious and so absurd that Taz asked it on commentary. (laughs) Yeah, he could not pretend that this was not stupid. <laughs> well, and I don't blame him. So, yes, that was dumb. Match was fine. Kong, this is the first time I've noticed her using uh, Umaga's acid in the corner spot. I don't know if she just stole that. I don't know if they worked together in Japan at some point, but there you go. Oh, then we had AJ and Sting, which the fans apparently voted best match of the year. I call shenanigans. I don't even know if there was legit voting. I call bullshit on all of this, actually. We had ODB and Hamada in the finals of the Knockouts title tournament. Maybe they did the voting, and, like, that was the match that all the fans that don't buy pay-per-views wanted to see the most. So that's why it won. I don't know. We had ODB and Hamada, finals of the Knockouts title tournament. Fans were way more into Hamada than ODB. And uh, ODB made a big... uh, Come back or something. I can't remember who was supposed to be the heel. I just know that the people ODB were... was certainly the heel by the end of it. Oh, yeah. Because the people loved Hamada, and TNA doesn't have a clue. Hamada, they have no clue. So, they in the middle of this match, Kong comes out with a table, and she sets it up outside, and they sent out a bunch of geeks to take her to the back. Now, first off, never mind the fact that, like, ten minutes earlier, she'd just gotten a glass of Jack broken over her head. She's totally fine now. So they they take her to the back, but they leave the table there, of course. The table, of course, comes into play. Apparently this was no count out, no DQ. I don't know. So Hamada puts her on the table, misses the moonsault, goes through the table, and ODB takes her to the ring, hits her with the TKO, and uh, and that was the finish. They, actually, they should call it the double DKO. That should be the name of her finish. Which, I bet it was much better. That took me two seconds to come up with, by the way. So that was the finish, and ODB got interviewed afterwards by uh, Boer Ash. Actually, it's, it's not that she got interviewed immediately afterwards. They told us, don't That's turn the right. channel. You must stay tuned. After this commercial break, ODB is going to cut a promo. Yes. This is a poor hook. So ODB gets in the ring, and Boer Ash announces, on January 4th, you're getting your title shot. Which, again, I thought they had mentioned about three and a half hours earlier. Indeed. Maybe th- they thought that the show had been on for so long that everybody would forget. And they should make this grand announcement all over again. So she cuts a promo on, uh, on a, uh, basically it was, it was on Tara, but she kept mentioning up there in reference to WWE, saying that unlike up there, the girls in TNA wrestled, they don't show skin or tits and ass, which she said as her tits were hanging out and while slapping her ass. This is where I got outraged. She said they don't show skin in TNA, and I thought, you know, not that long ago, this evening, I watched you wrestle a match in in which your opponent removed her shirt and stripped her bra. All night long, you've been wrestling in whatever your, that overall outfit you have is that is constantly uh, flying up, and your thong is riding up, and I see way too much of your ass this evening. 
And you constantly point to your ass, your tits, and your vagina. <laughs> Not to mention the beautiful people's entrance, and for example. People's entrance. Meanwhile, in WWE, every girl is now covered almost head to toe. <laughs> yes. But it was that costume contest, like, uh, what was it? Was it the, crit- the, Hall- I think the Halloween, Halloween costume contest? The lamest costume contest of all time. Where I, when, before it happened, I joked that perhaps they would come out, you know, dressed as, as a box. And, in fact, they almost did that. Yes. They completely obscured their bodies. So, anyway, this promo was bullshit. So she cut this bullshit promo in, and my notes read, in all caps, I have seen your ass all night. <laughs> so, uh, she buries Tara, and Tara comes out, and, and I actually thought, I, I literally thought that the end of this four-hour go-home show was going to be ODB burying the girls in WWE and Tara coming out to defend World Wrestling Entertainment. <laughs> I thought nothing would be more apropos ending to the show than that. you attack Maurice like that? Unfortunately, that did not happen. She called her a tatted up slut, threatened to kick her ass, and uh, it got it broke down into a brawl. And um, the show ended. Actually, there was another great line by ODB as she said with a straight face, "You're a joke." As the knocked up champ, yeah, really said this. Yes. Do they realize how funny this is? Unintentionally funny? I don't know. So they got in a brawl, and, and when it was over, I just thought, you know, that was a good angle, but that's your go-home angle for January 4th. So, good luck. They're so fucked. <laughs> they they are, are so, so fucked. I, it, it's astounding. Uh, we talked about the angle a lot. The, the match, it was amazing how much better Hamada is than everyone else in this company and how much they're not using her. I like the part where they were doing a... Simple uh, somersault. I think it was just a somersault off the apron dive. I think it was the same dive, same dive Tommy Dreamer did on ECW. And Hamada poses on the apron, and ODB is on the floor, and she turns around, and they stare at each other for a while. Nothing happens, and ODB nods, and Hamada actually has to wave, come closer. <laughs> ODB couldn't figure this out on her own. No, she she was, thought that maybe she was going to jump 14 feet, <laughs> so she had to come closer and take this dive. They, and they come out of the table, and in 2009, a very rabid chant of, we want tables, breaks out. And this is not a knock on TNA. It happens at all shows, really. Why do wrestling fans like tables so much? In 2009, we've all seen it a million times. If you told me right now, Vince, you will never again in your lifetime see a pro wrestler go through a table in a match, I would say, so? <laughs> Fine. I don't care. It's a big deal. And uh, <laughs> I don't get it. I don't understand the appeal. Then Hamada did... She did do a, a moonsault from the post, through a table on the floor. That was actually a pretty big spot, so if you're going to go through a table, I guess you do it like that to meet me actually scared. But this was it, this just dumb. That was Impact, and uh, that was the Impact that made me think I may be dying. <laughs> impact horrific. To the back! Hi, everybody. It's the Brian and Vinny Show. We got no music. We've been ranting for 20 minutes now. And uh, and the show wasn't recording. I don't know why. I could have sworn I hit the button. I did not. The only thing I can come up with here is that uh, Orlando Jordan was involved in some way. Because if you'll recall, the Orlando Jordan's time machine also had an incident where the show was not recording. Remember that? I do recall that. Orlando Jordan has fucking cursed the show yet again. Do you want to do any of the speech you gave beforehand? No, I don't care. Because of the 20-minute ranting we did, uh, more than 10 of it was you discussing website issues and stuff. Sorry the site was down, everybody. We're going to try and get a fix. And by we, I mean Brian and his friends. Much, much faster than the one I gave. All right. Impact. (laughs) Just moving on. No time to waste. I do not care. (laughs) Go. Just talk. (laughs) We had clips. 20 it, minutes. <laughs> gone. Gone. We're gone down the tubes. Can we just start where we left off? <laughs> no. Nobody gives a fuck about Mike Tanay reading the format. I will. Cu- I will. Cu- okay. To start with, uh, uh, Homicide the took only- way too long to get out of a goddamn cage. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing. <laughs> we discussed tattoos for a while. The stupid red cage. Uh, the fans saying this is bullshit in the first match and how that was the, uh, when the fans were saying this is bullshit in the first match in the history of the new era of Impact on the biggest show they've ever done, that's when I was laughing my ass off. Uh, and then, as noted, Homicide, after about an hour, escaped the cage, where he was probably hit in the head with a chair by Jeff Hardy. 20 minutes down the tube! <laughs> climbed up to get, it didn't take us 20 minutes to say all this. This show is, gonna, this show is just going to be something now, because my dander is up. My dander is up. <laughs> so then Jeff Hardy climbed the cage and sat there. By now... 
There are other places. In fact, you know what? It doesn't matter what our re- recap of this was. The show is replaying again Thursday. Watch the first ten minutes. Yes. You will understand. I recapped this entire show yesterday. Yeah. And earlier here, apparently. So, this is just going to take this show here. All right. Uh, we had uh, Hogan's motorcade was on the way. Remember that, everyone. Hulk Hogan was in a motorcade being led by police to the impact zone. I know. Christy interviewed Kevin Nash. He took a very long time to say that Hulk Hogan was his first mentor in the business, which is comical to me because I believe he was wrestling for like a decade before he ever met Hulk Hogan. He said Hulk, everywhere Hogan went became number one, and that meant TNA would be number one, and that meant Kevin Nash would be making more money, so he was excited. He finally closed saying Hulk Hogan is coming, and he's not alone. It's a free show. Who cares? You know what I mean? No one's paying for this particular episode, so it doesn't matter that we screwed it up, and it's, it's all falling apart at this point. I, I, honestly, I may just read my notes for being in this. You may as well. Stop being creative. The idea was that Vince was going to uh, read it. He's going to he's going to give his thoughts because I already gave him yesterday, and then I was going to chime in with witty and intelligent comments. And clearly, that idea failed. No. ODB versus Tara for uh, <clears throat> Tara's women's title. ODB got new gear. It's a uh, denim short. Did you cut? Turn me down. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should just leave. This may be time. Go lay on the couch, drink some water, and just take a nap. I can't believe I turned myself down. Jesus Christ! You okay, we so, are not drinking. No, he really is the stupid. Listen, you need take a deep breath. I'm not serious. You, I, you you've been on the go for like three days straight now. Maybe four because there was UFC on Saturday. I'm seriously losing my mind. Yes, I'm worried. You, you, you. I'm just gonna take a little break. All right. I'll let you. I'll be. I'll be back in two minutes. I'm just gonna go and walk around for a second. Take, go outside, get some air. It's a, it's a relatively warm night for a January in Seattle. All right. ODB versus Tara. ODB finally got new gear. It looked like before she had taken like a janitor's jumpsuit and just cut the sleeves and legs off. Now she has a denim top and shorts. It's a vast improvement. Uh, they had a short match, but for the most part was pretty good. Uh, probably Tara's best match in t- in her TNA career. We've been hard on her before, and this is pretty good. The finish was high, high comedy. Because you see, ODB, the schoolgirl, she cradled Tara, and then she grabbed the tights, revealing some of Tara's ass crack, and she got the pin. Now, I know this because we were told she had the pin, and the Rough Counter 3, we saw the uh, fans cheering and ODB celebrating with the belt. We did not see this. <laughs> For those of you. I'm sorry. I was distracted. Remember about three years ago, Brian promised something that if something happened, he would do a little dance. He just went outside the window and he delivered. You missed it. I'm sorry. So, ODB cradles Tara, pulls the tights, and then the director cuts away to a shot of the, as- of the asylum cage in darkness, empty, with the fans sitting there, apparently taped right before they went on the air. And then he cut back, and ODB had won the belt. And uh, as we mentioned 20 minutes ago, in 20 minutes of radio that was erased and not saved, in the first match... Because of the stupid disqualification in the Eight Man Steel Cage match, the fans were chanting, This is bullshit, only the chant was bleeped. So we got, This is bull, silence, over and over and over again. And then here, we saw some butt crack from Tara, and the director immediately cut away again. Now, it could be my imagination, but I don't think any of this would have happened on in, when Impact was on Thursdays. So it, it, it seems like. The, it seems like they could get away with this stuff, and there would not be this wacky censoring. So there's two theories that I have here. First, they hired a new director for this show who had never seen the product before and had no idea what to expect, and they gave him no notice of what they were doing, so he had no idea what to do. Or, and this is my favorite, they figured that since people may be watching the show, which they usually don't, they had better crack down on the obscenity and accidental nudity. That's my theory. They decided this show would be watched, and since and they, they, they had better cut down on this kind of thing, whereas on normal Thursdays, they don't have to worry because nobody's watching anyway. So Tara has just been pinned with an illegal hold, and, and she has lost her women's title. 
So she immediately jumps to her feet, lays ODB out with a widow's peak, and then put the spider on her, and then grabbed the title and held it up, making ODB's win completely irrelevant, making the title switch completely irrelevant. The whole thing was very stupid. I was begging for Hulk Hogan to arrive at this point. Desperate for the Hulk to show, to show up and save the show. I showed up to save the show! Did you drink while you were gone? That was a, some dance you did. <laughs> I can't tell. They're still turned down. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I just don't it's know. It's Christmas in January. I'm, I'm, uh, I am sober. I have not taken any gizmos. I have nothing. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm teetering on the edge right now, but I'm going to be all right. Let's keep going. So a limo showed up. Ric Flair got out. He... This is one of those things where I'm sure this is exactly how Ric Flair greets people in real life when he shows up in a new building. He walked up to everyone, he looked them in the eye, he smiled, he shook their hand, and he said, nice to meet you, how you doing? And I guarantee you, he, as soon as he passed them by, they were immediately out of his head, gone. Yeah. So the, the fans were saying, holy shit, again, it was censored here. We, they cut to a shot of the crowd, and uh, this is after a commercial break, we were told... Told, I say, not shown, that Ric Flair had gone to AJ Styles' locker room. Yeah. We got shots of Christy interviewing fans. The people of Walmart. The, 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 they were not as, as uh, terrifying as the people in the first fan segment of the show. But uh, Foley showed up. She ran to get an interview with him. She asked, what are you doing here at the Impact Zone? He said, I'm on my way to work, which I thought was a great answer. Turns out there was a memo that he had seen that said he had been barred from the building. He turned to the camera, and speaking directly to Dixie, he said he understood why they thought he may be disruptive, but he wanted to be there on this historic night. He promised to be in his best behavior. And he approached the gate, and there were two geeks there who said, no, you can't go in. And so Mick Foley, Cactus Jack, the hardcore legend, the guy who lost his ear arresting Vader, the guy who's gone into powerbomb, uh, to, to barbed wire, C4, chair shots, all that, looked at these two geeks and said, shucks, and walked away. <laughs> I I just liked how Foley is standing there at the gate of the impact zone. There's two geeks not letting him in. And he turns around and goes, I'm not being allowed in, folks. And in the background is a Ferris wheel. A well, Ferris wheel. They, they are at this. this is howled with laughter. <laughs> they are at, yes, the, the impact zone is a theme park. The last of these came out. He was loved at first. Crystal took the microphone, and before she even really said anything, this is like the best heel gimmick ever, just having this giant man stand there and let his woman speak for him. Yeah. And that's before she said a word. And then, of course, she healed on the fans immediately anyway. She said, uh, Lashley is great. She said, wrestling is full of inbred, toothless degenerates. So she had been watching the intro to the show. While honorable, strong, good men like Bobby had to find their way, she said he was asking for his immediate release from TNA because, and this is a quote, he has better things to do. <laughs> this company is amazing. Yeah. I was hoping this really was the end of Lashley and DNA. Like, he and, just came out, buried the company, and, and then went to strike for it. He actually... <laughs> hey, seriously! I, it's believable. Yeah. It's completely believable. So, apparently it is not, but he came out, buried the company, said he wanted out, and left. We had a... a the beautiful people paid strip poker, and it managed to not be entertaining. Yeah. Ponder that. The, the highlight of this was when Velvet asked, what is it that people want to see on TV these days? When I, I raised my hand, is it wrestling? No, the answer is poker shows. Sure, yeah. So they did bad comedy. We saw another shot of Hulk Hogan's motorcade. Uh, I don't know where they were driving, but there were no stripes in this road to indicate lanes of any kind. We saw uh, Razor Ramon and the One Two Three Kid were outside. The One Two Three Kid and Razor Ramon. Yeah. Twenty ten, everybody. <laughs> Twenty two thousand ten. Sorry, whichever. I, I, that's how I say. It's it. interchangeable to me. Whatever. Um, they were outside. Scott Hall. I, I don't want to cast aspersions or. or Rumors about, but he looked fucked up. He looked drunk. Yeah, uh, they wanted into the impact zone. They were not being let in. No, I'm not saying he was drunk. Everybody is it? He, looked, he drunk. looked drunk. That's how so maybe a great no. actor. Sure, or fucked up, whichever one. Either way. Oh, Mike today bragged about being the most searched item on Twitter. <laughs> well, you know, whatever. Maybe no, they were actually for a while. So well, good maybe, for them. Maybe. Well, does that make the money? Did he say what the, the Twitter was? Was it people saying, Christ, this show sucks. Why can't Homicide get out of the fucking cage? No. They did not indicate that. So, the motorcade stopped. The second limo pulled up. Somebody climbed out of the second limo into the first, and the motorcade continued. Yeah. 
And in hindsight, I have no fucking idea what the point of this was. I think it was supposed to be Bischoff, but I'm not sure. So Bischoff was late to the airport? I, I, do you, Vince, don't ask me. I don't have any idea. I have no idea, no idea what the point of this was. So we saw uh, Razor and 123 Kid walk in. They uh, walked in, got a big entrance, <laughs> posed, right love, on the front row. I love that after all these years, you're referring to him as the 123 Kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't mean it's not me. Diamond Stud and Sean Waltman showed up, everybody. Lightning Kid. Lightning Kid Lightning showed kid up. and the Diamond Stud. <laughs> That's much better. What a stupid name, by the way. Which one? Diamond Stud. They want him after an earring. <laughs> so, well, he was he was EDP's guy, and he was Diamond down the page. Yeah, he was Diamond's Stud. I see. Well. That's not a good answer. No. So, anyway, Hogan finally entered. It was five minutes before the top of the hour. He had generic NWO knockoff music. It was dressed all in black, giving away entire. If if the presence of Scott Hall and Sean Wallen didn't give it away, this did. He uh, was doing all his mannerisms. He got some pyro. He was also noticeably limping because he's Hulk Hogan. And he's walking down, and the fans are going nuts, and people are jumping up and down, and he's waving to him. He's he's you know being Hulk Hogan, and he gets to the uh, end of the aisle, and he turns to his right. And there's Holland Waltman going batty. Yeah. That made me laugh. Hard. They marked out completely. This is the this is the highlight of their lives, seeing Hulk Hogan arrive in TNA. That made me laugh hard. Uh, we saw a shot of Brooke Hogan there. Apparently, Hulk's uh, girlfriend was also there somewhere. She was right next to her. It was a blonde. <laughs> so it's yeah. A, a creepy subject that has been discussed to death. So, Hulk got in the ring, and... It's, <laughs> Hole, you say. Hulk, Hulk got in the ring. <laughs> That's a little dry. <laughs> like Hole Hogan. <laughs> it's a good name. It's a good porn name. You done? <laughs> I was just wondering if you were coming back. I, I, I don't know. Knew, I had a new gimmick for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's out. That's off the list. Hole Hogan. Unacceptable. <laughs> so. It's over! <laughs> yeah. So, as we've noted many times, there's no man on earth better at milking an ovation for all it's worth than Hulk Hogan. He uh, stood by the ropes, looked at the crowd, slowly shook his head back and forth, but of course made them cheer louder. Eventually this stopped. Uh, he said they were making history tonight. He said he had been in the back all day long. Yeah. So the motorcade was a decoy. <laughs> I guess so. Or perhaps just to pick up Bischoff. Well, he, he was there all day long, and then he left so he could be shown arriving in the limo. Maybe that's it. You know what I mean? I mean he could be. I, that Honestly, that's a better answer than I could think of. Yeah. So he said he had been in the back. He was impressed with the young faces and the old faces, too. Although I do he like said, a decoy, like a helicopter might be coming to drop a missile on his. <laughs> so they had a decoy. Yeah, they put ball. a hit on Hogan, the little tag it, sure. the motorcade, not knowing he was in the impact zone the entire exactly, time. Exactly, I see. Hulk has a new tattoo on his forearm. I believe it reads, I am what I am, which is hysterical for many no, reasons. No, it's, uh, it's actually a biblical line. It's, uh, uh, I am is... I it's I can't remember what it is. It's not, it's I, not I a, am that is. It's not a Popeye reference. It was. I was thinking more of that. Does Terry Bollea know who he is and who Hulk Hogan is? That's what made me laugh. So anyway, eventually he was uh, he was cutting this pointless promo really when Hall and Waltman suddenly jumped the guardrail. Security held them back. <laughs> can I can I add one thing here while I'm thinking about it? Can I stop when, you? I, when I was out doing that wacky dance. I finished dancing, and as I started to walk away, I, I saw my neighbor walking his dog. <laughs> you, you were in the middle of the parking lot of a full condo. I just, here. just nodded at him. <laughs> Go ahead. This is the same neighbor who always walks by and stares at us through the windows. We talk about yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Hall and Walton got in the ring. Hogan gave them the old NWO finger, you know, d- greeting. And uh, I thought Scott Hall was going to fall down at any point. But thankfully, he managed to stay on his feet. He said he wanted to hook up with the NWO again. He didn't use those words, of course, because he's not stupid. And he said he wanted to party and wanted to be in charge. Hogan said this is a different time and place, and it doesn't work that way anymore. And Waltman said it's the same place and the same people, and they were here to party. And Hulk said it would be totally different. They yammered back and forth a lot. Hulk said, Hulk Hogan said, it's time we all grow up. Awesome. He says, time we all grow up and do the right thing for the business. Hall said things are going to change with or without Hogan. This brought up Kevin Nash, and here the segment was 10 minutes old, and I'd had enough. Kevin Nash came down. He got between them, played Peacemaker, told 
Paul and Waltman to let Hogan play his role. Hogan said, no, no, I gave Dixie my word we're going to do the right thing and, and change the company for the better. He was not playing a role. And I said, well, that's not what you said on the phone. And he asked when Hogan turned corporate, as if that was an insult. And this is when Eric Bischoff came out, and the segment was 12 minutes old. Bischoff came out. He talked about beating WWE in the day, back in the day. He His exact words were, they took the 800-pound gorilla, put it into a cage, turned it into a monkey, put it into a cage, and spanked it. He was bragging about spanking a monkey. Not making that up. Cut to a shot of Dixie, no expression on her face, shaking her head. This same shot, they, they showed her over and over throughout the show. It may have been file footage. Just the same shot of her shaking her head 800 times. So Eric said he sided with Hogan, saying that things are going to be different, that everybody has to earn their position within this company. And it hit me here that Hogan and Bischoff were standing there talking about how it's time to make room for the young guys and give everyone a chance to earn their position. In this segment where they were eating up more than a quarter of an hour that could have gone to young guys who had giving them a chance to shine. So Nash said he heard them loud and clear. They bailed. Things were not done. Hulk and Eric talked about how great TNA was for a while. Eric said everyone was under a microscope. They cut back to the file footage of Dixie, Dixie shaking her head. Hulk vowed to be the number one sports entertainment company. Dixie clapped. That was the second shot. Here is where Eric demanded the format from the producer. It took them several seconds for them to locate this format. I was hoping... Praying that the incident would be that Eric would demand the format only to find out there was not one. And no one had any idea what was going on in this company. I like it better when they had a 65 page format. Is that what we had that one time? And that's what it seemed like he did. He goes, Where's the format? And they bring up this big fucking Bible size thing. Well, have you seen how many segments are on the show? I, I, I believe that. It's three hours. So, yeah, he tore up the format. He handed SoCal Val a new one. Hulk said that if you can't talk and you can't wrestle, you should head north. You know, in films, it's one page per minute yeah, on average. I believe that. So uh, that's 180 pages for an impact script, which may be realistic. I cut to a shot of Sting in the rafters, rafters. This segment finally ended. It went 18 excruciating minutes. This show was longer than, or this segment was longer than Raw, and by itself explains why they needed a third hour. So, to this point, we have seen the ship of the fans, the ship with the eight-man cage, a bunch of people arriving and being barred, and then this 18-minute gab fest, and I was bleeding from the eyes, just in, in misery watching the show. Actually, that was all right. All right. Let, me, let, me just, let me say one thing here. <clears throat> I gave a big speech earlier about why uh, I didn't hate Impact. Maybe I'll give it again later after it's been out of my system for a while, but I will say this, that I mentioned this on the... On the show with Dave either this afternoon or last night, the days are all running together here, but this show, the, the goal of this show was to do a big rating. The goal of this show was to do a really big rating and get Monday Night's Live. That's what they want to do. Spike wanted 1.5 million viewers. They ended up doing 2.2 million. Now, as much as you hated that segment, that segment did a 1.8 it was the highest rated segment. the highest segment, rated segment of the show. Highest rated, rated segment on the entire show. And keep in mind, this was going head to head with Brett versus Sean. So, to be fair, and I am always fair despite what people think when I talk about impact, you cannot complain about this segment at all. Because this oh, segment. I no, this segment. I, I, I can complain about it. I can say it accomplished its goal. It's sure. exactly what I was set up to do. All I, right, fine. But I this, still hated it. The point is that, that this this segment set out exactly what it was supposed to do. It accomplished exactly what it was supposed to do. And thus, I, I cannot uh, find fault in it. They they were out there to pop a giant rating. They were doing it head-to-head with Brett and Sean, for Christ's sake. It should have done horribly. But uh, it did really well. And most likely, based on the viewing patterns, it took viewers away from Brett and Sean. Because when the segment was over, everybody switched to Raw. So... That means those people would have been on Raw had it not been for this segment. So this segment, everybody, was a success, whether you thought it was a good segment or not. It was a commercial success. It pissed me off. And as usual, it's all the matter. That's fine. I don't need to see these old-ass geeks in the ring. So the new format that Eric Bischoff handed SoCal Val began with a match that was promised last week. It was the women's tag match, Kong and Hamada versus Sarita and Taylor. Uh, during the match, they cut backstage where the machine guns had been killed. And the there was a great spot here where Awesome Kong had Sarita in a or Sarita was going for a crucifix on Kong, and then Taylor charged her and Kong just kicked Taylor and then dropped Sarita to the mat and it was awesome. 
And the faces hit big crisscross dies, and after that eighteen minute talking segment, we got two minutes of wrestling and they went to a commercial. Yeah. I was furious. They came back, everything was going fine, and there was a four way spot that went kind of awry. Taz was talking about Charlie Haas knocking up your leg, and I was confused. And then I realized he was meaning Charlie Horse. He's from Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, eventually, Sarita was pinned with a powerbomb dropkick combo. The champions, or the former champions, I should say, were left laying, completely devastated. The, I guess their heels, Kong and Hamada, just destroyed them. They stood there triumphantly with their new belts. This was this was good stuff. Good segment. They, they established there were new champions, goddammit. Val Venus joined the poker party. He was wearing his towel. He uh, wanted to play. He insisted that, really, that the girls let him play. And he pointed out that he had very little clothing on. It was just his towel. And so if he lost one hand, he was screwed. So his tease for ratings was to tease that he might expose his dong. It was too bad that tattoo story got uh, edited out because I could have uh, made a joke about Val Venus losing his hand. You have a tattoo on his hand? Oh, I have losing oh. his poker hand, yeah. Move on. Mick Foley still could not get in. He went into like a side door. Security turned him away. It may have been the former main event mafia security. I don't care. It was. He left, and as he left, he passed the nasty boys. Yeah. They couldn't get him either. And actually, they were they were you know being the nasty boys. They were loud and nasty, nasty. And I was actually hoping their gimmick would be that they just showed up at the Impact Zone every week and could not get in. Well, Jericho did that for a while. It would have made it work even better here, just because they're the nasty boys. So, Raven and Stevie were in the ring like condemned men, and we found out why. They were wrestling Hernandez and Morgan. They lost in less than a minute. Morgan booted Stevie in the face and pinned him. And that was that. Yeah. We had a Pope interview. <laughs> and No, what we got here, Vinny, was Orlando Jordan. That's, I'm going to start with a positive. Because Orlando Jordan was not there when this thing was started. When this thing was started, the Pope was cutting a promo. You love the Pope. I do love the Pope. I love the Pope. Yeah. We all love the Pope. I don't know if I've ever seen the Pope as great as he was here. Uh, I don't know. It's just, this one didn't blow me away. I've seen great Pope promos. This one was this one was adequate. I was a big fan of the Pope. And then Orlando Jordan popped out of his time machine. Literally, because I haven't seen him in four years. And uh, walked up and wanted to know where Hulk was. It was kind of amusing here, because I remember years ago we were talking about uh, Orlando and how much he sucked on SmackDown, and someone talked about how he they liked him because he had a cool afro, and I pointed out that Elijah Burke was in Ohio Valley he had a much better afro. And here they were face-to-face. Elijah Burke's still much better. Yeah. So Jordan called the Pope a rip-off of himself, which was comical and infuriating at the same time. The point of this was to make Orlando look cool because he knew Hulk Hogan and make the Pope look look like a geek because Hulk had not bothered with him yet. So this is distressing on many, many, many levels. And then Jordan walked away and Pope said something. And then he pinned Desmond Wolf in three minutes. Sucks to be Desmond. Sucks to be the Pope. Well, sucks at least it bad least, to be Desmond. Well, no, it really doesn't. I mean, it, it sucked to be him because he went from feuding with Kurt Angle to jobbing to the Pope. But at least he was, like, dominating the match before he got pinned with a small package. In three minutes. This was not a Raven and Stevie uh, type of deal. That's true. That's true, but it, it still doesn't bode well for him. I'll say that. I, then what can you do? I said, Talk he, about the he was out there. He was out there with his pale skin and buzz cut and plain gear, and he did not look like a guy who would rock Hulk Hogan's world. Let's talk about the AJ promo. I'm going to uh, expedite this show. The AJ promo? You're skipping a bit. Jared showed up. Jared showed up. Rhino was killed. Uh, Bubba the Love Sponge was so concerned about Rhino's death that he had to grab the microphone from Borash and stuff him out of the way. I did not even know Rhino was killed. Rhino was killed. Uh, uh, who cares? Taz and Tanae killed an hour or so talking about nothing. Then we got an AJ promo. He said it was the most exciting night in TNA history. He touched on his uh, pay-per-view match with Angle in two weeks. He said he would find out who was best at Genesis. Bischoff walked in. So this is the great AJ Styles. This is the TNA World Champion. And to make a long story short, he canceled the pay-per-view main event and said it would take place tonight instead. And AJ thought this was great news. Yeah. Because, of course, he learned booking under Vince Russo. I don't know. Jeff Jarrett came out to the ring, started talking about TNA, slammed the critics who said they wouldn't last six months. That's me, everybody. Tried to get... What would best of you had named you? That fucker Brian. He uh, said he tried to get Hogan in for years. He... 
emphasize Monday night, how it was the most important night of wrestling. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a that would be a great thing to say if this wasn't a one-time deal. And then my world stopped. Yeah. When it hit me for the first time, maybe it's not a one-time deal. Yeah. So the most rewarding thing he had done was give the young guys a chance. Like He named Beer Money and the Machine Guns, Daniels, Joe, and AJ. And every they, they repeatedly cut to Dixie, and she was sitting there looking pretty and not moving like a mannequin. Jared talked about how great TNA was for a She's long time. She's going to be one of the top stars on the show, too. Think about that. Better than Stephanie. Oh, I don't know, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have never... I have yeah. I predict she'll be better than Stephanie. So. I think you'll be surprised. So, in, Hogan, Hogan, like, in what way, though? Seriously. I've never wanted to punch Dixie. I've well, then she's wanted. not doing her job. I suppose so. <sighs> so, Hogan cut Jared off, finally told him to stop talking about I, I, I. Told the truth about the company, which is that Jarrett ran it into the ground and it would have been dead if Dixie hadn't stepped in the sit to save it. That was funny. And the fans, I noticed this on Monday, the fans hated yes. the truth. It was, it was they the could truth. not handle the truth. They could not handle the truth. In fact, it wasn't a few good men in Florida. Anyway, the, uh, he, Hogan said they restructured the company. Hogan was now the partner. Now the young guys are going to get a shot, and Jarrett had to prove himself. And it was sort of funny, because if you listen to the content of Hulk Hogan's promo... The content was all very babyface. Well, His, did you did you read the update? I did read the update. I understand that the deal things went awry, but still, his delivery was very dickish. Yeah, he's, he he because he, I, well, I don't know. I I don't know. They're they're, they're going for shades of gray, I guess. Well, but, actually, they're supposed to be babyfaces though, both sides. Well, that's that, is that not the definition of shades of gray? Well, no, they're both supposed to be babyfaces. Yes, so. Well, anyway. All supposed to be white. Okay. Here's a, there was a segment here that would theoretically be Christy interviewing Daniels. Really, it was Christy cutting a promo while Daniels stood next to her. Yeah. And as soon as he started to talk, he was interrupted by Jeremy Borash, and he threw up his hands and walked away. <laughs> poor fuck. Sucks to be Chris Daniels. Oh, this poor guy. So, Borash had Foley on the phone. He told Christy he wants me to let him in. Christy told him not to, wisely. Borash did. He walked over the door and opened it, and Foley stormed in. That was that. Yeah. Jeff Hardy was painting backstage. Shannon was marking out for the painting. How did I miss these segments? They were, dude. Were these the weird segments where they're doing a commercial, and then they cut back to a no. segment in the middle of the commercial? No. They were. They did do one of those of, of Jared. Uh, after, after he arrived, remember, he walked in and sort of clapped himself and smiled and nodded and walked back and forth. I have no idea how I missed it. They, they did that. They cut the commercial. They came back. He was still nodding and smiling and walking back and forth and back to commercials. But no, the, the thing with it, Jeff was, you know, these, it's TNA. These, these segments are like 20 seconds long. I guess so. There's a button on the remote that skips ahead 30 seconds. So I was trying to figure out because later they had this segment with, uh, with Jeff leaving and he was, he was mobbed by the underage girls. And he had a painting. And he had the painting and yep. I'm like, why the fuck does Jeff Hardy have a painting of himself at the fucking Impact Zone? <laughs> Which I guess now that you mention that, the question is, why the fuck was Jeff backstage at the Impact Zone painting? Don't know. <laughs> I don't. I really don't know. We answered that the question answer is better because he's Jeff Hardy. But seriously, someone explain this to me. Yeah, but for, for those of you who wonder why we missed stuff on Impact, this is why. There's a button on the remote that skips ahead 30 seconds. So if there's a segment that's less than 30 seconds long and it happens to fall in the middle of that 30 seconds we jump. We miss it. And that's not our fault. It's Team A's fault for making segments less than 30 seconds long. So we got Abyss versus Samoa Joe. We were told it was their first match ever. It did not feel special in any way. Joe has lost some weight. They showed a, a, a shot of Sting, who was in the rafters, I guess, and I wrote down... The rafters! Yeah, and I wrote down, Sting is still there. And right after I wrote that down, Mike Deney explained, that just confirms that Sting is still here. <laughs> they had a pretty good match. Joe got a kick out of a choke slam. There was a chair shot to the head, and then at Joe, least it was a light one, unlike the one Jeff gave homicide. Was, was much better than the the homicide one. Uh, yeah, Joe hit a chair shot and then and then applied the uh, rear naked choke. And Abyss, remember when Brock Lesnar tapped to Frank Muir and he was tapping, but you couldn't tell because he was no good at it. And he was like this, his big paw was just lumbering slowly up and down off the mat. Abyss was much slower than that. Apparently, some of these guys need to learn how to tap out. Yeah, it's tough. So, Bischoff was backstage talking to a director or someone, who, and he told the guy, we need to shorten that segment. Script, everybody. Well, I just laughed because there were 40 minutes left in the show, and they were still rewriting it. Yeah, of course. Crystal confronted him, 
he did not care that Bobby Lashley was leaving TNA. No. Made no, no. no difference to him whatsoever. Of course not. Crystal demanded a meeting with Hogan. Bischoff told her to wait in line. She said they were losing the biggest star TNA has ever had. Bischoff laughed out loud. A hearty <laughs> Billy laugh. Because, you see, Bobby Lashley is not a star. So they paid Bobby Lashley a bunch of money and then buried him and made him invaluable. Well, no, these guys didn't. It's a new Where's regime. It? Changes are coming. I see. Changes are coming. So they they, they they want to bury the previous regime's acquisition yeah. rather than try to... Okay. So Bubba Love Sponge could promo over the prone bodies of beer money. Someone was running backstage laying out wrestlers, and Bubba was doing this things purely for comedy. So useless. Nasties still could not get in the building. Bubba Love Sponge appeared and distracted the security, and he snuck in. We got a Kurt Angle promo. He explained that he lost his title in September to an incredibly talented wrestler named AJ Styles, but it was actually a four-way match, and AJ never beat him one-on-one. He said AJ can't beat him one-on-one, and it's time for him to reclaim the title. It's a good promo. Yeah. We got This is the wacky Jeff and Shannon segment. Oh, my God. Where they had envelopes. Shannon said, this is what we came for. Jeff says, maybe. Hey, maybe. Well, all I can think there is... Maybe. Do I have two thoughts? Two thoughts. One, Shannon needs a job much more than Jeff. That's true. Two, <laughs> Jeff may not be available for employment soon regardless. Oh, yeah. So I can see why Shannon would be more excited about this than Jeff. So then three girls came screaming up to Jeff. He gave them his painting. He got into his cool yellow car, and he left. That was Jeff Hardy's return to TNA. Yeah. Boy, did they drop the ball on that guy. Although... Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't. I, I, we honestly, shall see. Yeah, <laughs> he did get indicted. All right, let's get let's keep the show moving. The nasty boys stole through these locker room. They turned down donuts and demanded beer, pizza, and wings. They spray painted the wall. They were censored a lot. Then we got AJ Styles and Kurt Angle. Generally, this match was awesome. Uh, there was a another human being running into the middle. <laughs> Well, I shouldn't say in the middle. It was at least early in the match, and he ran in and attacked AJ. The ref somehow missed this, so Kurt Angle beat him up, sent him packing, and then they just kept wrestling. Yeah. And they couldn't have done this, like, during AJ's entrance. No, of course not. Before the bell rang. No, it had to be during the match. In the match. So the, the, the other critique I have seen in this match, which is fair, is that they worked it uh, in more of a Japanese style in that they both hit their finishers repeatedly and kept taking out of them. And I can see how for some people that would uh, they hate that. I don't need to see it every week, but I thought for this one time it worked great. I I, th- I think these two guys have their finishers finishers established enough that it's okay that Kurt Angle kicked out of five styles clashes or whatever it was. And by the end, AJ hit one and didn't make a cover. He hit the Springboard 450 and won. So there was a chant of who needs Brett during this match. Bam. People were jumping up and down at points. Uh, there was 24 minutes left in the show when they started. Uh, they didn't use all 24 minutes, but they were close, 18, 20, somewhere in there. And uh, Ric Flair, oh, this is the other critique. Towards the finish, they're doing all these near falls. People are going crazy. Ric Flair rambles out. Yeah. Stands there. Just stands at the ramp. So that distracts from, not only not just does that take away uh, the fans who are in the building, does that distract them, but he didn't do this in a submission hold or after a big move when both guys were laying on the ground, there was shit going on. And Ric Flair walked out, and the camera cut to him, and we heard, like, a bump and the ref counting. We had no idea what was going on. So he stays out there for a while, and then, this is crazy, he leaves. He's <laughs> the, seen enough. He, <laughs> he's seen enough finishers being kicked out of. <laughs> well, I could, he may be in that group I was talking about. That may not have been his cup of tea. But they're, they're doing shit in the ring, the crowd's going nuts. And then we get a shot of the ramp of a camera shaking back and forth. Yeah. The camera then turns to Flair, and he leaves. Yeah. And so he distracted us from the match twice. And they had a commercial right near the end. And the best part about that was Mike Tanay announced. Well, I've heard this. I, I Go ahead. Mike Tanay announced they're going to stick with this as long as it goes. And then he threw it to commercial in the same sentence. What he was saying was that the show was not going to go off the air until the match was finished, because they were coming up to the top of the end of the show. That's what he was saying. I, I, I am not... Uh, I heard a lot of people criticizing that one, but that, that's not what he was saying. So I had no problem with... Well, I had a problem with the commercial, but not because of that's what he said. But All right, final segment. Go ahead. So AJ finally won, pinned Kurt clean. They had an embrace. Dixie was clapping. Her face had not changed. 
Hogan came out on the ramp. He said, those are the two greatest wrestlers in this business today. Said they had nothing but respect for Kurt. And AJ, you just raised the TNA bar to a whole other level. And about that point, someone ran up and interrupted him. And he jogged backstage. Foley had found the strip poker room where no one was naked. Val told Foley... After three hours. Yeah. Val told Foley where to go to find close Bischoff. hands. Indeed. A lot of ties in the strip poker game. Uh, <laughs> I remember in high school once. Oh, no. This is the story will not go where you're thinking. But I was playing cards with some girls, believe it or not, and uh, another guy came up and said, we should play strip poker. And the girl said, what's that? And the guy said, here, I'll show you. I thought, all right. And he uh, told us, he told me, deal out a hand of cards to everyone. I dealt out a hand of cards to everyone, and he said, all right, everyone put your cards down. And I had, like, two pair or something. And I, I had the high card, had the high hand. And he looks at the hands and says, all right, that guy won, so the three of us need to get naked. They didn't. It's <laughs> good line. Smooth operator, this kid. <laughs> so, anyway, Val told Foley where to go to find Hogan. It turned out to be his old office, and Hogan was not there, but Bischoff was. Eric told him that he was no longer the executive shareholder. Apparently, they took his ownership of the company away, somehow. Bischoff told him to put his boots on and get in line with everyone else. Foley said he had vowed to never work for Eric Bischoff again, and since he was going to get fired anyway, he may as well knock Eric's teeth down his throat. Just then, the NWO ran in, beat up Foley for a while, and until finally, Hogan finally arrived. The action stopped. Everyone turned to Hogan, and he had an, an, an indecisive look on his face, unclear, ambiguous. That's what we're looking for. He had an ambiguous look on his face, and the show ended. And I will do my uh, my uh, statement one more time for those that have been wondering as they, they listened to yesterday's show, and, and they wondered how I could have possibly liked Impact. And uh, as I said in the 20 minutes when we were recording but not recording, I read a lot of the feedback yesterday. A lot of people hated the show with uh, extreme passion. They hated the show. People, as, as Vinny noted, wanted to bomb the Impact Zone. They wanted to drop bombs on uh, Universal Studios. That's how much they hated the show. And I thought about it, too, and I, I also wondered. I was wondering, why did these people hate this show so much? And I was fine with it, as I said. And my theory is that People like me and Vince and those of you that watch the show every single week. Survivors. We are survivors. We have seen some bullshit. Go back and listen to the Adrenaline Flush compilations put together by Katrera. They're available in the radio show section on the board. We have seen some of the worst programming of all time on Thursday nights on Spike TV. I mean, god-awful, atrocious fucking programming. When you're a person who's seen it all, as we have, you watch an impact like the one this past Monday, and it was fine. The people that really hated that show passionately were people that either, A, were watching Impact for the very first time, and for those of you that were doing that, God bless you, and they were people that had quit and were coming back and giving it a try again. Those were the people that hated Impact. And if you're one of those people and you, you're not a regular Impact viewer and you're not weaned on Impact, so to speak then uh, my apologies. I didn't write it. Don't blame me, but I'm sorry that, that you had to be exposed to that. For those of us who have seen it all, grading on the impact curve, Monday night's show was fine. The majority of impacts are definitely worse than that show. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. If that was your first impact, you thought that was bad? Sweet Christ. You yeah. should see what we've watched in the last several years. The horrors shows, we have seen. Shows that put that program to shame. Things that cannot be unseen. Yeah, when it comes to logic holes, shit not making sense, stupid angles, and bad short matches, we have seen it all. So, watching that one on Monday, it was a perfectly acceptable version of Impact. To the back! Let's get into this Impact show. This was the follow-up show to... Uh, to Monday's, uh, the January 4th program. It was, uh, this was one of the better impacts in a long time. If you, uh, normally watch Impact, my God, was this on another level. But, uh, still a few problems here and there, but let's get into it. Generation Me against the Motor City Machine Guns. Generation Me are the former Young Bucks. They are now Max and Jeremy. Apparently they don't have last names. Perhaps her last name is me. I do not know. Or generation. Yeah, something like that. So I guess they felt that the fringe looked too indie, so they put them in black jeans with belts. They need to look now. They had not just black jeans, black jeans with purple belts, one of them had a purple headband, and they both had purple pocket hankies. 
They looked even more like wannabe Hardy Boys. Yeah. Not they good. Were, they, and a, you've got Jeff Hardy, for Christ's sake. Not the actual Jeff Hardy. So No one knows. Well, they had. It's a mystery. They were standing in the ring in their, in their Jeff Hardy, Matt Hardy Halloween costumes, looking nervous as all hell. And then, thankfully, the match started. Yeah. Things got better. Shelly actually moved remarkably well, despite his back being completely fucked up, and uh, ended up hitting their finisher, which is a rolling fireman's carry, followed by a 450 splash, followed by a moonsault, which I think that they should call that finisher the move set. That is my uh, <laughs> That's my. Uh, that is a much better name and more bang for your buck. Yeah. It's a really cool Especially finisher. Especially since they're no longer the Young Bucks, yes. for fuck's sake. The, the geeks in the crowd were chanting Young Bucks at them. That's not helping. Taz did ask, who are these young bucks? <laughs> then he, then he laughed at his own joke. That made it great. Insider insider comedy there. So insider th- lols. Th- this went about five, perhaps even six minutes, which is an eternity by Impact standards. It was tremendous fun. Uh, the announcer sold it as a giant upset when Generation Me won. Uh, kind of sucks for the machine guns, but what can you do? No, it doesn't. It, it has, this shit has to be done. It, it, mm-hmm. the, they, if the old Impact, these guys would have debuted and gotten beaten. And that would have sucked. You just know what happened. And that would have sucked. So, two thumbs up for this first segment. Yeah. We had the Nasty Boys destroying 3D's locker room, and Bubba and Devon were pounding on the door trying to get in, <laughs> and the Nasties wouldn't let them in, and they were saying, this is our locker room now, which means they trashed their yes. own locker room. They vandalized and ruined and destroyed their own locker room. Dumb. Fools. Dumb, dumb. Dumb fools, as Tyson said. Hogan promised a big surprise for Genesis. He actually promised an impact player. Yeah. Lance Storm returns. Yeah. Or just incredible. Either way. Sure. Or Rick Steiner. Who knows? That's what I'm hoping for. Is he an impact player? No. But I, that's the first thing I thought of. Maybe he'll be in his mystery man costume. Angle came out and said when AJ pinned him last week, it proved he deserved the world title. Said that he gave AJ everything he had until there was nothing left. AJ was the better man. But he said it's for one night. Said when two great athletes got in the ring, you win some, you lose some. The real champion was the guy who held the title at the end. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, when's the end? <laughs> well, maybe the end was last week and AJ's got the title. Do you just keep adding matches until you get the last one? You have to get the last win in? Or, and moreover, shouldn't it be not necessarily, not necessarily the big win in the end, but the most wins? If AJ wins ten times and Kurt wins once, does that mean Kurt's better? Yeah. So out came AJ... And they got to chit-chatting, and they agreed to put the title on the line again on Sunday. But it was Angle's last shot at the title for 2010. Or, I think, until AJ loses the title. More so, likely. I don't think AJ is going to go 12 months undefeated. Doubtful. So the people booed, and Angle said that was fine. He'd only need one more shot. They shook and hugged. And then after Angle left, the mad masked madman jumped AJ. Stomped hole in him, unmasked, it was Tomko, and there were some boos, and then there were three chicks that inexplicably squealed at the top of their lungs for Tomko. I don't know why, but they did. <laughs> I was trying to figure out why he chose this time to unmask. He had attacked him many times before, and uh, not unmasked, and he took it off here, and uh, they did several little mini promos of Tomko without the night. He tried to explain why he took the mask off. I was not satisfied with any of these explanations. Yeah, especially since that was the big faux pas of the show. If there was one thing that made no sense on this show. It's that Tyson comes out and unmasks, and then they have, like, three segments of pre-tapes of Tomko yes. explaining not only why he beat up AJ, but why he unmasked and how he's going to win the title tonight. Amazingly quick work by that production team, yeah. if this was real. Well, I think some of them aired before the match was made. Hmm. So I don't know. So, then we had Hemi interviewing Hall, Nash, and Waltman, who are going to be called The Band. She actually called Waltman Six Pac, which I think was the only time on the show they did that. <clears throat> Bubba the Love Sponge walked in, took over, said nobody had heard or seen from Foley since what happened to him last week when they beat him up ten days ago. And Nash was trying to uh, change the subject. Bubba was telling him to just work with him and give him an answer, and they refused. Hall babbled something completely incoherent. And that was into that. Bubba is actually fine in this role. I got no problem with him. He's a fine backstage interviewer. He's better than Christie. He is undoubtedly better than Christie. Yeah. It, 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 it still amuses me that they can't just have him interview people. He has to walk in on the interviews and take the mic over. Yeah. But once he gets in and starts doing the interview, he's fine. So the beautiful people came out, and Velvet noticed Angelina Love in the front row. And she 
went over and hugged her, and in by far the greatest moment of her career, all the girls were hugging Angelina, and Lacey goes up with a big smile and shakes her hand, but it was like the fakest smile you've ever seen. It was perfect. Perfect! It could not have been done better. So they get in the ring, they have a match. It's Kong and Hamada versus Velvet and Madison. And uh, Hamada selling for Velvet Sky was absurd. But uh, what can you do? Kong got the hot tag, destroyed him, powerbombed Madison for the pin. Angelina was appalled. She hit the ring. She, uh, I guess, helped clear the ring or whatever. Anyway, she uh, proceeded to beat up all three of the beautiful people, including Velvet. A couple problems here. One of which is she fell down twice while uh, beating them all up. That was not good. And second, what a stupid swerve. Like, I think literally only a moron would split these people up the first day Angelina comes back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it, it, Angelina and Velvet were awesome. Mm -hmm. They took Velvet out of the picture, and the beautiful people went from being the hottest act in the company to just another group of girls. Mm -hmm. So they finally get Angelina back. They don't even put her and Velvet together for a feud against the other two first. No. No. Vel she immediately beats up Velvet. No, they don't even... They don't even... Tease Angelina going rogue and killing everyone. They could have had her pretending to be friends for a while and you know build to the turn. No, one segment, one 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 segment. This, <laughs> she's just back with This them. I give a thumbs down to. And then she storms up the ramp and she's like, she's all angry because she was replaced. And uh, you know they're all about these insider storylines. So if we're gonna go insider here, her fucking visa was invalid. Well, the the whose fucking fault is that? All Velvet but, skies. The, all but said that uh, on on commentary. That's not, that's not even insider. But, well, how dare you replace me when I'm not allowed in the country? That's what she said. It's retarded. That was something a heel would say because she would want Velvet to be her friend forever, even though she wasn't there. Don't buy it. Don't like that's it. Good. That's how, I know this is going to sound strange coming from me, but that's how some women think. <laughs> Let's move on. AJ Storm didn't want to talk to Hogan. He wasn't there. So AJ was all pissed off about Tom Coe and was ranting and raving, and I use that term loosely. A AJ getting mad is the least believable thing in wrestling nowadays. He's no good as, as, as the pissed-off guy, no. He tries to act like an angry, tough guy, and he comes off as, like, a guy in a high school play that's Throwing really... Throwing a hissy fit. Not even that. Like, he's trying to act like a tough guy, but you know he's not. He, like, is in the chess club. But he's talking about kicking people's asses. I just, I don't buy it. But Eric apparently does. So they agreed to book AJ and Tomko for the title. Well, here's how that went down. Eric kissed AJ's ass for a while, talked about how great he was. I was the TNA champ in the face of the company and the best of the best, blah, blah, blah. He said, what do you want? And AJ said, I want Tomko tonight. And Eric said, well, as it turns out, I need a favor, too. I need a main event for this show, he said. And if this main event's going to mean anything... I need you to put your title on the line. AJ said, okay. Eric smiled. They shook hands and it was on. Why did Eric not have a main event for his own show? Why is he willing to risk his pay-per-view main event for a main event of Impact that was not booked when the show started? And if he's unwilling to have a main event without a title match, why didn't he bother to book a, 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 a title match ahead of time? None of this made a damn lick of sense. This, this segment annoyed me. Borash met with Eric, wanted to know where Foley was, and Eric said, I have no idea. And he told Borash to go try and find him and added that if Borash ever did something as stupid as letting Foley into the building when he wasn't supposed to again, he would never breathe another breath in the impact zone. And then uh, Beer Money came in and said they had a problem with the band. And Eric said he would get back to them on that. They wanted a match. And Eric said he'd think about it. I believe it was the last time on this show we heard about Mick Foley. Fortunately, we found out later where he was. He was hosting Epics after the show. Yes. Just fine. Talking that about was a classic TNA moment. <laughs> he was perfectly fine, happy to be there. Listen, a bunch of great Kurt Angle matches. One of which, by the way, Kurt Angle and AJ Styles from like three years ago. Yeah. So, Lashley came out and destroyed Creed and Lethal, who were on their way to the ring for a match with Team 3D. And Lashley is starting to look more like an MMA fighter and less like a cartoon character. He's down at least 30 pounds from his peak and... Crystal talked about how this was just the beginning, and this doom would continue until Eric got back to her on a request. What is her request, by the way? To leave. Yeah, Lashley wants to quit. 
<laughs> so why do you keep coming to work? I don't know. This also made no sense. No. At all. So, with lethal consequences down in the ring, Team 3D came to the ring with an axe. Lethal consequences was laid out. 3D hit 1 and 3D and 1. Bubba Ray took the microphone. He said the last week, they had been wrestling in the Tokyo Dome in front of 50,000 people. And when they got to the back, the Japanese press wanted to ask them about the Nasty Boys. This was a lie. The <laughs> Japanese press, I assure you, never once asked Bubba Ray about sags and or knobs. Well, so, he asked where the Nasty Boys had been, wanted to know how they had ridden Hulk Hogan's coattails into TNA, said they had been locked out of the dressing room, and they had to dress in the hallway like a couple of young boys. Number one, nice insider reference. Number two, they were wearing pants and t-shirts. They didn't... They had to change into this? Well, don't you remember that street fight where Buddy and Richie had Halliburns with a, with new, other jeans. a different pair of jeans yeah, in them? They, they, they do have more experience than I do. So they took their axe, they busted into the locker room, and then the Nasty Boys... No, you're forgetting the most important thing here, where Bubba Ray Dudley called the Nasty Boys beached whales. <laughs> Guaranteed Jerry Sags is is uh, is 40 pounds lighter than Bubba Ray Dudley. Guaranteed. Probably true. Nobbs is, in fact, a beach whale. We had Val Venus come out, now Sean Morley, doing the same Val Venus shtick, talking about how he's no longer a film star, but now a producer and a director, and his job at TNA, I guess, is to make porn films. He... But he added they're, they're not going straight to DVD, so apparently he's shooting on 16mm, like the 70s. Well, it's going straight to YouTube. That could be as well. But yes, he, he avoided the words pornography, erotica, anything close to that. Erotica. Sure. I wish he would have said that. He merely said films. Daniels came out and tried to be his friend, but then turned on him with a clothesline and cut a great promo, actually. A great promo. He did. About uh, how, you know, I I didn't I didn't get fired and fight my way back to let a creep like you come in here and fuck up this company with your bullshit. And not those exact words, of course. But Morley then made his own comeback, which I hated. I hate shit like that. There's nothing worse <laughs> than a heel beating up a baby face and leaving him laying... But then he doesn't, because the babyface makes a fucking comeback. Is why, more than babyface? Why couldn't Daniels have just laid out Val Venus, and then next week Val Venus gets his comeback? Don't know. And then the week after that, you have the match, or something. You it's, know what I mean? It's actually worse than that. Why, did everything, why does everything have to rush? At least, and I will say this, at least Daniels did not beat up Val. Val made his own comeback, and then Daniels beat him up again. They do that all that the time, too. That is the one I hate more than anything on this too, planet. That, that, they've been able to do that, too. The b worst thing about this was that it's not just that he laid him out with a clothesline. He did this, then he had his finisher. The best moonsault ever. And by the way, this move trumps MVP doing the running leapfrog as far as cool wrestling moves, moves done in nice threads. So he gets his finisher, the best moonsault ever. The crowd's going crazy. He continues cutting his promo... Then he, after his finisher, moves on to the punches, and then Val makes his comeback. Finisher killed! Yeah, kind of lame. Daniel was awesome, though. Daniels. Val Venus was good as well, so Val, Val was, I will give one thumbs up. The, the, the other, I don't know if this is a positive or a, minor, or a negative, but I, it made me laugh. They kept cutting to random girls in the crowd. Some were smiling or laughing. Many just had completely vacant stares on their face. Yeah. Is Val supposed to be a sex symbol? I think so. I see. Yeah. So, then we had Beer Money against Hernandez and Matt Morgan. Quick TV match. Big Rob came out and attacked Hernandez for the DQ, which led to Matt Morgan and Rob Terry brawling. Wow. Horrible. Wow. <clears throat> this was horrendous. And then the band hit the ring and beat up Beer Money. And then Eric came out to announce Beer Money versus the band for the pay-per-view. So... Yeah, this is a thumbs up. It was uh, fine, and it's leading to a horrendous match. It was, it was nice. two of them actually. <laughs> yeah, it, it made sense. It was largely a mess for what we saw. Hernandez hit his big dive, and then turned to the camera and whistled like the whistle that opens his theme music. This gimmick sucks. A lucha whistle. I guess so. They showed Sting in the Raptors in 2010, which is never not funny. For seriously three seconds. Yeah. And he was never seen again. Samoa Joe and Nigel McGuinness with the Pope doing commentary. This was awesome. They uh, Taz and and the Pope got in a big discussion about how to say roof. This yes, this had to be a rib. I this. think they were agreeing with me, by the way. Roof. Yeah, yeah. So they had an awesome match. The fans chanted, "This is wrestling." It was, in fact, wrestling. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, Nigel, who lost on January 4th, beat Samoa Joe clean with the Tower of London. <laughs> huh. New well, Booker. Indeed. New uh, Booker. And, uh, well, not in news his last show, but you know, they had Pope beat Wolf on the three-hour show, and they're doing a rematch on the pay-per-view. I don't know why, really, after Pope won clean, but they are. And then they announced this, and then Desmond Wolf won here. And that stunned me, <laughs> because that's what I expect in TNA is to do something stupid. But no, Desmond Wolf has a pay-per-view match. Samoa Joe does not. Therefore, Desmond Wolf beat Samoa Joe. Okay, cool. That's great. Yeah. I'm happy. Thumbs up segment right here. And then Pope and Wolf talk smack at each other for a while. Desmond threatened to kill him. I liked Pope's line where he threatened, and this is a direct quote, he said he was going to get funky like a junkie. Yeah. Awesome. Scary. We had uh, Tomko doing a tape promo, as noted, talking about why he attacked AJ and how he was going to win the title. And that was kind of fascinating. This got put together so quickly. He just said this was the right time. And again, I ask, why? Then we had a Hogan Bischoff segment with Jarrett. Hogan was there in the office. <laughs> that was, yes, he earlier had been missing, and then he was here for this one segment and then gone again. Yep. So Jarrett storms in, freaking out. Ranting and raving about this company he founded, carried for seven and a half years, blah, blah, blah. They start screaming about how the young guys suck. There's not enough talent in TNA to fill up a coffee cup, aside from himself. So he is turning heel, obviously. And made some inside references to stuff like defamation of character lawsuits, which, uh, you know, whatever. So Eric finally told him to shut up, and he said, listen, these are the facts. The Jared started TNA, they would have been out of business in three weeks if it wasn't for Dixie Carter. And actually, to be fair, it was six weeks. But, said Jared con Dixie into dumping money in this place. True. Con the wrestlers. True. Con the fans. True. Bischoff said the place was going to turn around, but it was going to turn around because of him and Hogan, not Jarrett. And said if Jarrett wanted to stick around, he needed to put his boots on and prove himself like everybody else and... Jarrett was there with an attorney, and he got mad, and he kept screaming and yelling, and Hogan finally stood up and said he was hired to run the company, brother, but there was nothing in his contract that said he couldn't beat Jeff's hillbilly ass. And everybody cheered and chanted Hogan in the crowd, and Jarrett, like a proper heel, stormed out, suddenly changed his tune. Yeah. He was still angry, but he said he should talk like gentlemen, and then he threatened, said he had heard the last of him, and he left. Yeah. I was... Amazed me fine with this segment. Eric said he needed an attitude adjustment, so I guess they're going to sick somebody on him. Another very good segment. Eric Bischoff really is a great performer. He was awesome on this show. Yeah. He was the man on this show. This promo especially. Yeah. It's strange how his babyface and heel characters are the same, but he got a babyface promo here, and it was awesome. So way to go, Eric. Flair came out to a 2001 ripoff and then went down to do commentary. Right. This was stupid. <laughs> Seriously, everybody listening to this right now, you have just taken over a wrestling company. You've signed Rick fucking Flair. Your idea is on the debut show, he walks out and watches 30 Part of a match. seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds of a match, walks away. And on his second show, he comes out to do commentary. You've got Ric Flair. Mind-boggling. See, Flair hasn't cut a single promo in front of the people. No. See, you, you, you were more outraged by this than I was. And it's not that I think this is good. I just think that his appearance on the first show was so stupid. This was less stupid than that. And so it did not bother me. This was dumb. At least at least the people at home got to hear him speak. And he called the match, and he, he knew Styles' name, and he also knew Tomko's name. That caught me off guard. <laughs> so they have a match, and there wasn't much to it. It was fine. They had uh, Angle coming out to shake hands with Flair, which, of course, was more important than the match, so they showed that. Flair was very low-key on commentary, by the way. Not even really any good. So AJ hit the Pele out of nowhere for the pin. Tomko jumped up again and just started beating on him to... Render the finish useless. Of course. This is the big blow off the feud. And then uh, and then AJ made the save. Kurt made the save. Uh, sorry, Kurt made the save for AJ. Extended his hand and flared the booth, stood up, shot AJ a look, and AJ walked off without shaking the hand, and then Flair smiled. 
So AJ and Flair are apparently a, a father-son duo here in TNA, which is fine. And hopefully Flair will get to fucking cut a promo in the next two shows and explain all this shit. And, uh, yeah, not much of an ending to the show here, but I, I can't complain all that much. It wasn't like it was bad or shit didn't make sense or there was there was logic holds galore. I will say they plugged the pay-per-view, Genesis, and I swear to God they called it a night of firsts. In what way? Don't know. The main event is a rematch of a match we saw two weeks ago. Two, and two years ago before that. That's right, in, a, in, a, in something that aired immediately afterwards. We've got Scott fucking Hall, Kevin Nash, Sean Waltman. What is new? You've never ODB seen... and Tara. How many times have yeah. we seen that fucking match? Well, you've never seen a two out of three falls. Let me, let me look at this lineup here. I just like the point of this. They were doing... It was like UFC-style promos where the guys were looking just off camera and talking. And AJ said, AJ Styles, the World Heavyweight Champion, main event of the pay-per-view, said, Why should you buy Genesis? Hulk Hogan. Yeah. I just put my face in my hands. Let's look at the lineup for the show here. AJ Styles, Kurt Angle for the title. This should be good. British Invasion versus Matt Morgan and Hernandez. I do not have high hopes. Rob Terry will apparently be in the match, I would think. He brawled with with, uh, Morgan. Maybe they won't put him in there. Hopefully not. This may may be all right. I'm not expecting a, a really good match. Beer money against Hall and Nash. Did you see Hall and Nash brawling tonight? One very good. When they hit the ring and uh, stomped a mud hole in, in, uh, in beer money? No, no, no. Not good at all. The Pope and Desmond Wolf should be good. Amazing Reg faces a mystery man for the X title. I don't even know who. No one knows, apparently. Lashley and Abyss, I don't have high hopes for. Morley and Daniels actually should be pretty good. <laughs> Let's go back for a second. Why is Bobby Lashley wrestling Abyss? I don't have any earthly idea. I mean, beyond, forget, forget for a second that he wants to quit, and therefore you think we'll just not wrestle. Nothing was done for this no. at all. I, I do not know. And then uh, ODB and Tara for the knockouts title, two out of three falls. That sounds horrifying. So we'll see what happens on uh, Sunday. They got a, a big surprise debuting as well. RVD perhaps, Ken Anderson, I don't know. But uh, we'll find out on Sunday, so... Oh, if it's Ken Anderson. <laughs> well, it's uh, very well maybe, Vinny. I mean, wow. uh, I don't know who else they've got. It's so. just incredible. Yeah, I guess they could do Impact that. Impact player, Hulk Hogan said. Yeah. Maybe Don Marie. Could be. Jason. We'll, uh, we'll find out. It's not going to be Lance Storm. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, we'll find out on Sunday, but uh, anyway, yeah, that is uh, it. I'm going to play one more song here. Oh, by the way, uh, I'll give that impact, um, I'll give it a thumb up. Oh, yeah. I can't give it two thumbs up. No. Because um, there are problems here and there. I'm, I'm grading on a steeper, or I'm, I'm grading on a different curve now. And it, Well, it's a thumb up, but it's not just a thumb up on the impact curve. This was a good wrestling show, all in all. Yeah, not- on the impact scale, it was two thumbs up. Yes. On a, on a regular wrestling show, it was one thumb up. This blew ECW out of the water. And better than Raw. Better than Raw. Probably not as good as SmackDown has been lately. Yeah. Yeah. To the back! Big story of the weekend was the TNA pay-per-view, and it was an interesting show. It was the first show, the first pay-per-view, with Hogan, Bischoff, and company in charge. And it wasn't very good. Which is kind of funny. It's uh, an irony, in fact. Before this new regime came along, we had a bunch of horrible impact shows. Just atrocious programs. Nothing made sense. There was something stupid in literally every single segment. It was a black hole of logic. I hated the TV. But then they would have pay-per-views and there'd be a lot of good matches on the shows. Of course, the catch-22 is, why would anyone possibly buy the pay-per-views if you've got this horrible impact show that gives you no good reason to buy the pay-per-views? So anyway, the Thursday show with Bischoff in charge, Bischoff largely writing the show and Hogan looking over Russo's shoulder and all that, much better TV show, a much better TV show. Like, one of the better impact shows of the past year. Lance Storm said it best. There was nothing on that show that made me mad. Not a single thing on that entire program. Very rare. That's saying something. Yeah. That led us to this pay-per-view, which had a bunch of shitty matches. 
I mean, it's a show where you look at the card and you go, how could this show possibly be good? Who thought it was a good idea to have ODB and Tara, for example, in a best of three falls match? Clearly a fool. Did have a great main event, I'll say that. Not the best main event I've ever seen out of TNA. In fact, I only gave it three and a half stars. But may have been just because the rest of the show dragged it down. But just kind of interesting in the sense that now we've got another catch-22 and that what if what if this TV starts starts getting good enough that people want to buy the pay-per-views, but then they buy the pay-per-views and get bad shows? That's no good either. That's no good either. No. And it's kind of funny because there were a lot of changes in the show, and many of them were positive. But at the end of the night, it was still a bad show. Yeah, what they Very need profound. what they need is is a guy who's going to go, okay, here's the lineup for the next pay-per-view. Put together a pay-per-view that's actually going to be good, which apparently they used to do back in the old days. And then have someone with a clue write the TV leading to the pay-per-view. They need to get the best of both worlds. Like before, somebody, and I, I don't even know if it was Vince Russo, but, but somebody in TNA, back when, when the old regime was in charge, they made sure that the pay-per-view was going to be good. They chose a bunch of matches that were going to work on pay-per-view, and then Vince Russo wrote some horrible TV leading up to it. Now they've written some acceptable TV leading to a horrible pay-per-view, a bunch of matches that no one could possibly think would be any good. So whoever was putting the matches together, whoever said, okay, at lockdown, this is the lineup, and you put together a card that looks good on paper, that guy needs to do that, and then Bischoff and Hogan need to write the TV leading to it. Then maybe there's going to be a chance for this company. But... Wow, this was a bad pay-per-view. It, was, it dragged. It went forever. It was a long series of very similar, very boring matches. There was an excellent main event. There was a pretty good opener. And little of any value in the middle. They brought the four-sided ring back. And... Well, it's funny, because when I said there were positive changes in the show, Hogan and Bischoff walking, came out on stage and walked down the ramp, and I thought, this is not in the impact zone, is it? And it turns out it is. They just redid it. There are many changes. There is a ramp. They redid the stage. It looks like a whole new building. The building actually looks much better. There was a lot of empty space before where now there are fans, and that's good. And, yes, they cut two sides off the ring. Yeah, so a four-sided ring, and all day today I was getting emails. And it was mind-boggling how many fucking people cared about the ring. They either were angry that the six-sided ring were gone, or they were jubilant that the four-sided ring had returned. They didn't care about Kennedy coming back. No. They didn't care about the big surprise that was promised to debut, which ended up being Kennedy. Nobody cared about anything except that ring. Boggles my mind. And really, when you watch this show, like, halfway through the first match, somebody sent me yet another email about the ring. And I was suddenly reminded that they had a four-sided ring. Because I didn't even notice. It, it, It doesn't matter no it's completely it does not irrelevant matter anybody angry about the ring one way or the other stop it doesn't matter now that being said when hogan and bischoff began to speak and the first thing the crowd did was passionately chant we want six sides i cackled it was funny that made me laugh hard but you know what? and it got better because hogan then could a spirited promo on them saying you had the six sided ring- sides for years look where it got you no more playpen rings. Yeah. No more six sides. No more eight sides. This is where wrestling was born. This is where wrestling was meant to be. It was a great promo. He so. cut a promo on the ring. He did. And it was tremendous. Yeah. And there's probably going to be a Hogan versus ring battle at some point down the road here, which is uh, interesting. But it doesn't matter, everybody. It doesn't matter. And I know that people are very, very angry about the crowd tonight and some of the stuff that they were chanting. The crowd doesn't matter either. <laughs> they matter in the sense that... They chant things on pay-per-view, and sometimes they ruin the atmosphere like they did tonight. But you can't book for those people. Book what you think is going to work for TNA. If these fans don't like it, tough shit. They're not paying. These fans are getting in free. To me, they don't have a say, okay? (laughs) They just don't have a say. If they don't like it, they'll stop coming and new fans will show up. Everything's going to be fine. Do not book your company around these Impact Zone fans who are getting in for free. It's like our own website. I listen to the people that pay and who are nice to me. Don't really listen to, to the... <laughs> oh, there's a lot of people who pay you don't listen to either. That's right. But, but, I mean, I don't listen, but you do not listen to the freeloaders. The, yeah, the freeloaders that are bitching about this and that, okay, pony up and then we'll have a talk, okay? I can't be sitting here listening to what the freeloaders say about how to make the pay site better. They ain't paying for it. 
The people that are actually paying for this site and are nice to me, those are the people that I'm going to listen to and go, you know what, maybe you're right. Maybe we should try and do this or that. I'll send it along to Admin Tony. But the Impact Zone fans, God bless them. I have nothing against them. But TNA should not be booking their product around what you want. So, show open with the aforementioned promo on the ring. Hogan got booed a lot, and then he talked about how we're going to do to Vince McMahon. They were coming to get him, brother. And then everybody cheered, and so he got on their good side again. He also made it very clear that there was going to be no sports entertainment in this company. It was all about wrestling. Yeah. Remember that. So we had Red against the debuting Brian Kendrick. I gave the match two and three-quarter stars. It was fine. Uh, I don't want to say it was a style clash, but Red is a high flyer. Kendrick works WWE style now, and they just had that sort of match, basically. They had a fairly average SmackDown match. Red made a comeback, and match fell apart. Both guys got absolutely lost. And finally, Red hit a springboard code red for the pin. Finish was awesome. Match just went too long. And really, if you look at the, the, the show in a whole, you know, a lot of these matches should have gone shorter, but uh, they didn't, and they still had a lot of time left for the main event, so they should have added a match or something, or a skit or whatever. Which is the opposite, I think, of every TNA pay-per-view ever. Yeah. There, there Certainly was based on impacts. Too much in-ring time, believe it or not. Yeah, the, the matches went too long on a TNA show. Yeah. That has never happened. And one of the changes I was talking about that was positive, I know it was especially obvious here because Red was involved, but up and down the show, matches were booked much more simpler. There were, I believe, two disputed finishes all night, and one was in the main event, so that it meant something. There were, uh, aside from the main event, there were not eight billion near falls. There were, uh, they, they, they all had a, a little opening segment, and then a heat, and then a comeback, and then a finish. And it was all... Even though a lot of the matches were boring, they were at least not irritating or confounding. Again, or there was nothing on the show to make you mad. Yeah. You don't sit there here. Was, I'm not going to sit here and review this show and point out something stupid in every single segment yeah. or multiple things, which we used to do. Well, even just even even just in ring, when TNA just left a match alone, it would usually it would or I shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't say usually it would often be just a constant blur of action, and then one guy would get his hands raised and they would move on. This time there was. There were stories and matches. There were <laughs> theoretically good guys and bad guys. There was there were finishes being told, and uh, uh, there was uh, there was very little interference. And there was something else I was going to say that I forget now. So we'll just move on. But this was a good match. I think I went three stars with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, like, like I say, it felt like an average SmackDown match, and that's not a bad thing. Bischoff met with Hall, Nash, and Waltman, and Eric thanked them for beating up Mick Foley and said if. If they hadn't beaten him up, Mick Foley would have eaten his lunch. That's his exact words. Yeah. Awesome. So he said that Nash was under contract, but Hall and Waltman were not, and they needed to prove themselves. And Hogan told them to do it tonight and get it done, or there might be trouble. So after they left, Hall and Waltman got in an argument about who was going to wrestle tonight. Hall wanted it, since so he needed to prove himself. And Waltman was basically like, you know, you suck. So they they had what appeared to be a shoot rock, scissors, rock paper, scissors contest. I say that because they went two out of three falls, and one of the falls was a draw. So we watched these two men play rock, paper, scissors for 30 seconds. It was long. Crowd chanted boring. They were not ter- totally wrong. No. It was not a shoot, by the way. The Hall was pulled from this show prior to this afternoon. I know there's a there's actually a story going around that is hilarious. story is that Hall showed up today and was going to work, but then he put on his trunks and realized he was not in ring shape yet. <laughs> So the man is always wearing a track suit. <laughs> he never looks in the mirror when he's never, in his underwear. Ever, ever. He has not been naked in years. He has showered in his track suit, yes. That was great. That's not true, by the way, everyone. And we had Sean Morley and Chris Daniels. Morley came out and people chanted, we want wrestling. Yeah, remember when I said, Hogan said it was all about wrestling and no more sports entertainment? Meanwhile, he has brought in Val Venus to promote sports entertainment, and he's being booked as the babyface. Yeah. He talked about TNA films. He got... Little, if any, reaction. Daniels came out, cut a great promo about how he was very defiant. Couldn't believe he was here to talk about his films again. He said he beat him up Thursday. He was going to do it again. The fans were going crazy for him, and he turned to him and he yelled, Shut your mouths! Yeah. And the fans were just... He stuck up for wrestling and then turned heel. Yeah. He so, was supposed to be hated. Very confusing on that. Well, what happened was they wanted Morley to be the babyface and Daniels to be the heel. But the fans liked 
They like Daniels. Daniels they see him, and Hayden Morley. They see him as their guy. They know he's a good wrestler. They see Val as a washed up WWE reject. Um, and, 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 and perhaps I'm overreacting to this. I just think it's funny that Hogan promotes wrestling over sports entertainment and then books a feud where the guy defending wrestling is the heel. Anyway, the point was that uh, nobody cared about the match at all. That's because not that really they true. didn't want to cheer the guy they were supposed to, and they didn't want to boo the guy they were supposed to. So it was a two-star average match. Crowd was busy chanting stuff like, Sit down, Brooke! Her and uh, Hogan's new fiance uh, Jennifer, were standing up the entire time well, trying to cheer people on. Yes, they, they were... Actually, I didn't notice her after the second half of the show, so maybe they took her away. But for, throughout the first several matches... She was being referred to and interacting with the rest of us so much, I was certain and terrified she's going to become a character. Val will. gave her his towel. She probably will. She probably will. O, uh, ODB almost hit her or something, so sucked. So Val went for his big splash, and I don't know if he couldn't get his footing legit or if he was selling or whatever, but he stumbled around up there and then finally uh, hit it. And the fans were so unhappy that a bunch of dudes in the front row all turned their backs on the ring after the pinfall. So uh, it was all right. I, I have seen worse, but this did not work. ODB and Tara, two out of three falls. This was not as bad as I expected. It was a star and a half. Tara won the first fall with a small package, and then she won two in a row with the uh, Widow's, uh, Widow's Peak. Uh, ODB was busy checking her pulse throughout the match. I don't know why. The announcers didn't know why. It distracted from the match. I was wondering if she was in the middle of having a heart attack. I don't fucking know. But uh, just not a good match. No. Um, ODB was her usual wacky self. I wonder if she does that because they told her, don't touch your breasts and ass so much. And so she's doing something else now instead. I bet they didn't tell her that. Well, that's my best theory because there's no other reason for it. It was rather plodding. The, the highlight by far was ODB hooked long body scissors and then switched it to a Kiwi roll, which I never get tired of seeing. And, uh, yeah, Tara won two falls, so she is clearly now your knockouts champion, and this is one of the, one of the pauses of the show, and by and large, when people won, they won decisively, and this was one of those times. Matt Morgan and Homicide, or Hernandez, beat the British Invasion, which everybody pretty much expected, since the British Invasion is, uh, not doomed. Well, I don't know about Doom, but the booking crew, the current crew, does not seem to care at all about them. They actually had a competitive match, believe it or not, and uh, Baby Faces made a big comeback, and Hernandez finally sent Williams outside. Morgan hit the big boot on Magnus for the pin, and uh, two and a half stars. It was uh, better than you would expect. There, there was a point here that at the very beginning, beginning, like a minute in, where it appeared that Hernandez and Morgan were already bickering. That annoyed me, but it was so... The camera almost missed it, because the British Invasion were hanging out outside or whatever. But uh, nothing came of it, so I don't know if they were teasing something. I don't know if they actually got mad at each other. I don't know what happened, but it was strange. They had an okay match, had a very hot finish with the baby faces running wild. And at the end, the baby faces had such a dominant win that both guys were running around hitting, hitting their moves. Mor- Morgan finally hit the carbon fr- footprint and made the pin, with Hernandez standing beside him. This was even more of an emphatic win than the uh, knockouts match. There is no doubt that in TNA right now, the top tag team is Hernandez and Matt Morgan. And that's good. Yeah. Desmond Wolf and the Pope. Actually, first we had a segment that sucked. It was uh, Lashley storming into Eric's office. It's... And Abyss was in there talking to Eric. And so I guess he tried to jump Abyss. So Abyss just made his own comeback, clonked Lashley with something. Lashley fell and took a bump on the way couch, the safest place possible, and then laid there like he was dead. It was so... Horribly low rent, and Lashley looked like the absolute biggest fool you've ever seen. The best part was Abyss picks up uh, the monitor off Eric's desk, and it's a very modern monitor, very light with a nice broad flat surface, a very safe object to hit someone with. And he throws the shot, and Lashley wisely puts up both hands and uh, then sells, and it missed him by three or four inches. And I know this because they did this spot exactly sideways to the camera, making it abundantly clear to everyone this is fake. Yeah. Fools. So, Eric yelled at Abyss for knocking out his opponent tonight, and then Hogan came in and told him not to worry about Lashley because Abyss was still going to wrestle, and his new opponent would be even better, which in hindsight was a lie. (laughs) A dirty, dirty lie. He told him to take all that craziness, insanity, leave it in the locker room, prove he could wrestle tonight, and Abyss said he was going to bring his A game, and he'd better start doing some crunches. Crunches and sit-ups, he said. That amused me. Hogan and and Abyss had a long face-to-face chat here. It was interesting, especially considering what happened to Abyss later, but, you know, 
If Abyss had been along 20 years earlier, he would have made a minute with Hogan and made a lot of money. So maybe Hogan sees something in the guy. Desmond Wolf and the Pope, two and a quarter stars, ended up a disappointment. It was going along all right for a while, and then it kept going and going and going to the point where they really should have cut out like seven minutes of this match. Had they cut out seven minutes, it probably would have been the best match on the show. But unfortunately, it was just... It was too much stuff. They completely lost the crowd, and the crowd loved the Pope. So think about that. So it went on and on and on and on and on, and finally the Pope went for the double knees to the back, but as he was running, Nigel killed him with a lariat for the pin, and they claimed the reason it happened was because Pope's knees had been injured, and he couldn't run fast enough to hit the knees, and he got cut off at the pass, which, hey, fine Cre- story. Creative. Creative. And, and, and logical and rational. He didn't, and I can, can confirm that... Desmond did work his knees over because I watched him put him in 8,000 leg locks over the course of this nine-hour match. It went very long. Uh, I love Desmond, but his you know his offense by nature is it's very slow and plodding, which can be fine if the babyface then makes a big fiery comeback. But this time, Desmond first of all, Desmond was on offense for like five minutes at a time, so there there was no fiery comeback. And then when Pope made one, it was also slow and plodding. This match did not rock my world. It went on for a really long time. Uh, Desmond won, which confuses me because the Pope won on Impact. I think on the January 4th show, he beat him like a minute or whatever it was. He got many, many near falls here. A couple of times off small packages, which was the finish of their first match. He hit a few other big moves, but Desmond got to kick, to kick out, and then he hit the Lariat for the win. So perhaps they have not given up hope on Desmond de- uh, yet. He also got new gear and a new girl. That's right. He came out with a new girl who was so forgettable I forgot about her. Yeah. We thought she might have been lazy. It wasn't. Bischoff met with Borash backstage and basically fired him and then handed the mic to Christy when Flair walked up. And his first TNA promo, everyone, was not cut in the ring, but it was cut backstage. So they really do think they're WWE. And he then proceeded to say absolutely nothing. He said, uh, yeah. He said, I'm not going to tell you why I'm here. You'll find out when I feel this time is right. Then he said, woo. The band faced beer money. It was a star and three-quarter, which was, honestly, much better than I was expecting it to be. Did you have very low hopes for Waltman? No, I had a lot. I thought it was going to be Hall and Nash. Oh, well, that'll do it then. Okay. Yeah, they put Waltman I, in I there. Just, for some reason, I, I don't know if I ever really thought about it, but I assumed Sean Waltman would be in this from the moment it was announced. Well. So, and whenever he was in there, it was fine. So it was Wal- good. Waltman and Nash. Nash was not good. The man can barely move. And they got the heat for a while. Robbie, Robert Roode made a comeback. And there was one great spot where he hit a move, and Nash basically broke it up by oozing onto him like a living tar pit. <laughs> he, he is the best. He turned into the blob, yes. He did. You got to see. Roode was making, his, he was making an awesome comeback, by the way, running wild on six block and hitting all his big moves. And he made a cover, and yes, Na- Nash, it was like a... <laughs> The, the the blob putting on him or uh, continental drift pushing him aside. It, it was, was not even that. It was like it was just like a um, like a. <laughs> I, I, I can't top the blob. It ended with Nash pushing very slowly, Rob Root aside, and and he was now atop of Six Block himself, basically pinning his own partner. So then out came Hall, lumbering out like the father of Al Bundy. And I can't help but notice this came right after Beer Money did the Beer Money suplex and all the fans chanted along. So I assume Hall was in the back and he heard everyone shouting beer and came out to see what was up. So he started beating up this fan in the front row, which distracted everybody. And Waltman was out there trying to stop him. And so in the ring, Nash went for the power bomb. Storm super kicked him. Rude cradled him for the pin. Nobody noticed Nash getting pinned because they were too busy looking at the geek being thrown out because Hall beat him up. That's not fair. So then Hall got in the ring. I have no idea how he achieved his feet and <laughs> did some horrible crotch chops, and then it was over. And Hogan later vowed that he was going to call out the band on Thursday because he was sick of them or something. He said he was too busy tonight, which... Yeah, yeah his, his plate was full. He really should have done it tonight, God damn it. He has plenty of time. Yeah, uh, like we said, the match was pretty good whenever Sean Walton was in there, and pretty bad whenever Ganache was in. Not a surprise. James Storm has a big gut. He's got a gigantic gut. I, 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 I know. Uh, I, I understand. He, I'm fatter than him. Don't get me wrong, but I am not on national TV. Then we had Abyss against Mr. Anderson, which... Boy. He came out, and the fans went nuts. They were bowing. They were screaming. They were going crazy like a huge WWE star had debuted. Then the match began... 
Within about two minutes, they were chanting overrated. Then they were chanting boring. Then, then they just stopped chanting. caring. I think they took a collective group nap. Abyss made this comeback, and nobody cared. I mean, no human being cared at all. They did some near falls. They kicked out of some shit. And finally, a chair was brought into the ring. Nobody cared about that either. As the ref was getting rid of it, Anderson hit Abyss with Nux for the pin. So I guess they must think something of Abyss because they had to fuck finish him. So then the goofs in the crowd chanted, Cheater! And uh, Anderson got the pin, started a half. What the hell? <laughs> You're very generous. When you say no one gave a fuck about this match, there was a bit where they were wrestling in the ring and we could see the fans in the uh, you know from the hard camera, we could see the fans on the other side. And they were all... All of them looking to the right side of the screen is something happening off camera, in the, uh, I assume in the crowd, but we couldn't see what it was. could have been a fight. It could have been a girl taking her shirt off. Whatever it was, that's what they were looking at. But it couldn't have been that cool because they weren't making any noise for that either. either. They were staring at it. It was boring, but it was still better than what was going on in the match. That is the entire match in a nutshell. Yeah. The other point here is that Mr. Anderson at the finish reached into his trunks for brass knucks, and at the moment he reached into his trunks, he made a very lewd face. This will be the funniest animated gif of all time, just that in a loop. AJ and Angle for the title. I gave it three and a half stars. I, I know I underrated it. I don't know why. Well it just I just saw I just saw the was, match two weeks ago. It was a great match we have seen many, many times before. There was, like, nothing in this match that we haven't seen a hundred times. Yeah. And, and it was a fuck finish, so... Yeah. I mean, it was, there was nothing, nothing wrong. It was, yeah, it hell was, no. It was, it was a very good match, which is what three and a half stars indicates. They did a whole bunch of moves. It went, like, 26 minutes, probably a little too long. And Flair came out there to watch. And for the finish, ended up with Angle putting AJ in the ankle lock, scissoring the leg. And right as AJ's about to tap, Flair yanks the ref out of the ring, and AJ taps. So Angle gets all pissed off, and he goes after Flair. Flair goes into the ring. AJ lays out Kurt. Flair throws in the TNA title belt. AJ grabs it, looks confused. Flair demands he uses it. So AJ uses it and gets the pin and effectively turns heel, I guess turning Angle babyface if he wasn't already. And him and Flair celebrate it. So I guess Flair is now... Already a heel. <laughs> Not wasting any time here. <laughs> Flair is a evil heel for the... And he's a mouthpiece for the evil heel AJ. And to be honest with you, I'm fine with that. Yeah, that, I was going to say, why I'm you... totally fine. I hope AJ does the thing he did with Vince Russo years ago where he starts doing flips into the pool and he says, Flair, I learned a new flip. I learned a new flip. And Rick goes, oh, good job. Good job, Flair. Yes. Yeah, and uh, woo! Well, they, 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 we saw a, a lot of AJ and Flair partying together and... Flair was trying to teach AJ to strut, and young AJ has some work to do on the strutting. Yeah. But that was the other positive thing on the show that I forgot. I've, there, I never heard the words to the back. And even if they were mentioned or they cut to the back, it was never, this match is over, we must cut away instantly. We had plenty of time for all these finishes to sink in. We saw Hernandez and Morgan pick up the tag belts, admire them, do a high five with the belts and stand there in the ring. We had time to see beer money on the ramp, pointing at the, at the band and laughing because they had gotten some revenge. Oh, by the way, that's something else I forgot. Apparently, it was made clear that beer money was laid out by Hall Nash and Waltman. Did I miss a show? I remember them being laid out. Bubba the Love Sponge was standing over them, not knowing who it was. You missed Thursday. Did they announce it there? Don't you remember Hall throwing those horrible punches at beer money in the corner? I remember beer money calling them out. I guess that was it. And All they right. got beat up. All right, I'm an idiot. That's fine. But, uh, oh, yes, Jesus. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the point, point for this show being they let the finish of the match sink in and made it clear who won and who lost, so we the fans do, and that is good. Not to mention, every TNA pay-per-view, 99% of them have some bullshit finish in the main event. At least this one made sense. It was not all that complicated. In fact, it was very simple. Angle was about to get the win. Flair fucked him. He, the ref was out of commission. Only one ref bump. They didn't have about eight of them. Flair threw in the belt. AJ turned heel and hit Angle, and then he pinned him. They didn't do the stupid fucking belt shot, and the ref wakes up, and then Angle kicks out, and then they do more bullshit, and this After and that. After watching TNA for years and years and years, I was certain that Kurt Angle was going to kick out of this belt shot. They would just keep wrestling. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, you stay down. I can't even tell you how many TNA pay-per-views I've reviewed where they did something in the main event, usually involving Jeff Jarrett and Guitar, that was so goddamn convoluted that I had to read my notes word for word to alert the earth as to what happened. Here, I don't need my notes at all. No. I remember every single thing that happened. In fact, I have done this entire review without notes. Yeah. I took notes, and then I put my laptop away, and I have not read them. So the gist of this review here is that, Wrestling-wise, this was a weak TNA pay-per-view. One of the weaker TNA pay-per-views of the last few years, in fact. But there were many, many positive steps taken. There were many improvements on this show. So I'm not going to bury it. I'm no, going to give I, it I'll give it a thumbs in the middle. I, it was I will say I have never been so happy about a bad show before. Yeah, yes. And think about, I mean, I've seen shows with a lot better wrestling that I hated a hell of a lot more than I hated this show. Yes. So uh, this is an improvement, and uh, I'm not going to complain all that much. So, to the back. All right, Impact was a uh, well. It's a much better TV show than it used to be, with much worse wrestling. Yeah, that's the long and the short of it. There was good and bad, as as there always is, and there were some booking ideas here that just mind boggled me. I did not hate this show again. Yeah, I did not hate this show. Uh, wasn't wasn't the best show I've ever seen. I actually can't remember much of Raw, so I don't know if it was better than Raw. There's a big thread on the board about wh- whether it was better than Raw or not. And uh, uh, Raw was better. I'm trying to think. Of it had John on Heater on it, <laughs> and, he, and he was such a great heel. <laughs> That's right. John, John Heater blew away Impact by himself. Yeah. You know? So yeah, we'll uh, let's talk about this program here. Open up with a video package from Sunday, which actually included the fans chanting "We want six sides." So it is now part of the storyline that Hogan and Bischoff are bringing change. And people don't necessarily like it. The <laughs> storyline is that their fans are stupid, basically. And Flair and AJ arriving with some strippers, and AJ is now decked out like a mini nature boy. And uh, I was hoping he would step out of the limousine in his suit carrying a backpack. Actually, let me let me tell you something here about... As much as I did not hate this show, let me tell you why the Hogan-Bischoff regime will not last the year. And I'm going on record with that right now, by the way. Okay. So why the Hogan-Bischoff regime is not going to last the year. Because they don't know what they're doing. And I can tell you that because of two things in the very opening segment. Number one, of all the people on the show to be the new nature boy, they chose AJ Styles instead of the Pope. This is a sure sign that they don't know what they're doing. And second off, AJ didn't even bleach his hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, that's an, it, well, it, it, isn't like, that what the name comes from? Was Buddy Rogers bragging about his natural blonde hair? I mean, you're going to do a new Nature Boy gimmick, and you can't even bleach the guy's hair. I mean, his hair as is brown is so valuable that this is just a step too ridiculous to take. I remember when, when we did the uh, the new Heartbreakers gimmick with me and Buddy, and he insisted I bleach my hair. He said it just had to be done. Keep in mind this was the Indies in front of no people. Buddy would not let me do this gimmick without bleaching my fucking hair. AJ Styles on national television doing a gimmick as the new heel young nature boy, and they couldn't even bleach the guy's hair. This is proof they don't have any idea what they're doing. So, with that out of the way, Flair came out and actually cut a promo, which is a plus. At least they figured that out after a month. They'll be shocked. It was good. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it myself. Yeah. By the way, the blonde, Rick, was all over her this evening. If you uh, go back, he was uh, not messing around here. And he said there were three reasons he'd come to TNA. Number one, he hates Hulk Hogan. And the lifelong feud between the two of them would never be resolved until they finished it here in TNA. He said he would go to his grave before Hogan got away from him. Mm -hmm. Said number two, he'd been asked for 20 years who the new nature boy was. And, uh... The answer was nobody until four months ago when he started watching TNA. That's quite the uh, quite the statement right there, by the way. I never watched this until four months ago. Said Angles and Sting were great, but they weren't the next flair. The next flair was AJ Styles. AJ Styles, everybody. Flair then told this lewd story <clears throat> while wearing his wedding ring, mind you, about whining, dining, and fucking a young Southern belle who the punchline was... It ended up being Dixie Carter, and I did laugh uproariously. That was when I decided this was the best impact of all time. 
So Change my mind later. But. He said he basically fucked her and she gave him a contract. So. He was, he was yes, out, out of passion. Yeah. You know. So then AJ came out to do his Ric Flair promo, and, and uh, I'll say this. First off, obviously, the dude's no Ric Flair. Let's be honest well, here. It's a high standard, but it's true. This goofy, fake Ric Flair promo was still worlds better than his regular babyface promos. So I consider this an improvement. He did do the worst woo I've ever seen. So Angle and Hogan then came out, and, and uh, Hogan said that Angle's shot at AJ at the pay-per-view was his final one of 2010, but he was in charge. He changed his mind because he could. Because I can, brother. Mm-hmm. That's a quote. And he signed the match to an immediate rematch for tonight on the show in the main event. And then he added it was real, damn real. Said if Flair went down to ringside, he'd strip AJ of the title and give it to Kurt. And uh, I do have to say this. When you read about this in the spoilers, or when I read about it, it came off as complete bullshit. And obviously, in a sense, it is complete bullshit. They went back on a stip. A pay-per-view stip. Bad idea. With that said... At least they went back on a stip and gave a rematch to a babyface, which the people liked. Who had been screwed out of his rematch. Yeah. And so. and that was what they said. You know, you, you fucked the people. And you fucked Kurt. So, therefore, I'm going to give AJ a rematch. It... This is a horrible analogy, but if you remember that, uh, that second Tito Ortiz-Ken Shamrock match that uh, had the fuck finish on pay-per-view, they immediately gave it away for free on TV at their earliest convenience. And so uh, I liken it somewhat to that. It, it's a bad... It's really not that horrible analogy, if you think about it. It is a bad thing to, to go back on stipulations, especially very early on, but uh, it, it came across on TV better than it read in the spoilers, so I will say that. I just thought that the there's a point here where, you know, Flair came out, the first thing he said was, I hate Hulk Hogan. So he's standing there in the ring next to his new champion, AJ, and Hulk is taking away his win effectively and making him wrestle again. And Flair, they could have shot a Flair, and he's standing there staring at Hogan with hatred and bile in his face. And this shot of Flair standing there staring a hole through Hogan was more entertaining than anything that just to name one guy, Sanjay Dutt, ever did on Impact. I could name dozens of other people. It was too great. You're comparing anyone in the world to Ric Flair. Yes. Mm. Flair wins. All right. So then we had Mick Foley showing up and going nutty backstage, and then we cut away. There were there were a few uh, segments backstage that just cut away too quickly, but compared to the old impacts, I got no complaints. <laughs> so, again, if a normal impact had 40 segments, this one had 20. That's good. That's good. <clears throat> Matt Morgan and Hernandez against British Invasion, rematch for the tag titles. Worked over Morgan for a while. Hernandez made a cl- comeback. It was clunky. Fans were going nuts, but I couldn't tell if it was the impact zone or, or uh, crowd sweetening, or a little of both. And then Rob Terry came out with the briefcase, and Magnus tried to use it on his on uh, whoever, but hit his own guy, which led to the pin. And uh, the finish was clunky. Just this, for, it took did forever to pull off. Just did not work. And afterwards, Foley hit the ring, cleared the uh, ring with a chair, and then screamed to the camera that he was coming to see Hogan tonight. And then they played his music, which I had not heard in a month or so. I've forgotten how horrible it is. It's a horrible song. They played the Bubba the Love Sponge call to Jarrett earlier this week. No mention of Awesome Kong. So, uh, you know, at this point, that's not going to become a storyline. And Kong, by the way, has asked for her release. And I don't think they've given it to her. And I actually think they're avoiding her. So we'll see what happens. Is this kind of like, well, I guess if she's asked for her release, the answer is no. But It's actually very much like the Bobby Lashley situation. I was, I was going to say the main situation where he was just way too scary to fire. No, it, it's the Bobby Lashley situation where he wants to quit, but they won't have a meeting with him or right. whatever. So anyway, uh, this was just Jarrett telling Bubba that TNA was fine before he showed up, which, by the way, is a lie, and that he should just go his own way and... Uh, I was hoping this was their way of firing him from his TV job, but this, sadly, it was not. They did like four of these throughout the show, and it was really stupid because Jared kept saying he didn't want to talk, and then talking. Yeah. It's phone, dude. Hang it up. You know he did the first time. So Hogan told Eric there were two things they needed to handle tonight. The deal with Cactus Jack and, quote, that other thing. Russo obviously scripted that line. He didn't say what it was, of course. So Nash walked in, wanted to know what the deal was. Hogan said the bullshit with Hall and Nash had to stop. This is there's an awesome line he had here. He said they've been clowning around too much with playing rock, paper, scissors, 
and beating up fans. Mm -hmm. In Hogan's mind, these are equal. Equal crimes. So Hogan said they needed to... uh, He said he knew those guys were Nash's friends, but they were acting like idiots. And since it was survival of the fittest, Nash needed to go out there with Eric Young tonight and prove himself. And Nash said, I'll do it for you, Hulkster. Orlando Jordan then came out, and they interviewed the Pope backstage. And again, the Pope is not the new nature boy. AJ Styles is. So the Pope's back there. He cut an awesome promo, as he always does. And then he goes to the ring, and he uh, has a match with Orlando Johnson here. Orlando Jordan just sucks. I mean, his fucking lockup was... I was screaming at the TV screen. You were. At how bad this lockup was. Mike fucking Tyson had a better lockup did. than did. Orlando Jordan did here. Orlando's still not any good. He uh, sold for Pope for a long time. And then suddenly he gave me a dragon screw leg whip and a downward spiral and pinned him clean. Another example of why this regime... Obviously has no idea what they're doing. That is clear. The eye for talent here they is... They pinned... They jobbed out Pope for Orlando Jordan. Yeah. And he he lost... I realize he's selling a knee injury here, but he lost on two moves. Mm-hmm. He was murdered on live television here. This about sucked, I, were my exact words in my notes. The only, um, I said that fucking sucked. Hmm. I went a little farther, I guess. I will say there were two... Uh, I guess there's one positive. Orlando's hair is much cooler than it was in WWE. That's braids, saying nothing. The braids are a better idea. Chris interviewed Kurt about the match with AJ, and Kurt said we shouldn't see it again, but we were, because we were also seeing a new AJ. And he said that Flair, what Flair was doing, and made him sick to his stomach. AJ was a big boy. He had to accept the consequences, and the consequences were coming tonight. You wrote down way more about that than I did. I screwed it up, too. I wrote, Angle says he'll beat AJ, and I moved on. That's what we all did. We had more with Bob on the phone with Jarrett. And Jarrett cut a promo on him and hung up, and there was more to come, so don't don't fret. We had Eric meeting with Nash and said he needed some answers. Are you with me or are you with them? This is Eric Young, by the way. And Nash said, listen, I chose to be with you, Eric, because I saw something in you. And he said, I didn't know these guys were coming back. But listen, we'll go out there tonight. We'll do what we can. I know you. The band doesn't, but I'm sure that when they uh, when they meet you, you'll fit right in, which... As if. <laughs> <laughs> this was a horrible lie. Yeah. It would, in a perfect world, you would end up with Eric Young and Sean Waltman as a tag team and Kevin Nash and Scott Hall not wrestling. But I don't think that's going to happen. Let me tell you something about how uh, incompetent the old TNA Impact TV show was. Remember when Angelina came back and you read the spoilers and she immediately attacked all of the beautiful people? And I thought, how fucking stupid that she's not beating up Velvet. Or uh, well, that she's not teaming with Velvet. Why, why isn't it Angelina and Velvet, the original beautiful people, against the other two? Doesn't that make sense? And then they had the, the comeback where she beat him up on TV, and then she's walking to the back, and she's screaming about how, how dare you replace me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there thinking, you your visa did not get renewed. This was, this was announced on television. This is so fucking stupid. So anyway, on this show, they actually showed clips of the week after Angelina disappeared, the beautiful people did go on TV, and they talked about how she, due to a contract dispute, was no longer with them. They were replacing her, and then they proceeded to bury Angelina Love. I had completely, yes. completely forgotten about that. And it's not like this was in 2006. No. This was, this was a couple of months ago. Yes. Sir, but I that had... goddamn show had so much fucking shit happening that I completely, completely forgot that this ever occurred. That's saying something right there. So it actually does make sense that she beat him up. It does. But you would never have known that from watching an old fucking show. So it's a good thing they went back and showed us this promo. Yes. They this was a positive. So much better at TV. So they uh, had the match. It was Angelina destroying Madison Rain. You're and skipping... Am I? Two segments. Oh, God. I'll get back to that. Anyway, Fine. Angelina beat uh, Madison Rain, and then the beautiful people came out and uh, beat her up with their pink dildo, and that was that. There was a great moment where... Angelina was fighting two of them while, were, while Velvet welded the dildo like a weapon. And she was ready to swing, and Angelina had her back to her. And Velvet was smiling and saying, you're going to get it. And then Angelina just turned around. And suddenly Velvet was scurred. Yeah. Thankfully for her, there were three of them, and they overwhelmed her and beat her up. So there you go. We had more with Bubba and Jarrett, which I'd completely given up at this point. Thankfully, the, this was the last one. The hysterical thing was this was preceded by a... Plug. I, I, it was definitely by Spike TV, I think by TNA, asking for donations for Haiti. Yeah. That was high comedy. 
So Bubba's uh, ranting with Jared on the phone. I can't believe they're still using this fucking guy. It just boggles my mind. So anyway, they agreed that, that Jared would meet with Hulk Hogan. Eric would not be there, but Bubba would. Which makes me want to vomit, this guy. This, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're, I don't disagree. But looking at, I was looking at this the other way. There are people who listen to Bubba the Love Sponge. Why does the guy have a job in radio? I don't know. I don't know, but... Seriously, just amazes me. But he does, and to the point where there were people, you know, in the stands here at TNA wearing Bubba Army shirts. So, he has his fans. And what he gives his fans is this, like, five-minute dialogue with Jeff Jarrett, which no one on earth could possibly care about. No. I, watching this on TV, could imagine people in their cars with satellite radio turning to the classic rock station or new country or anything else but Jeff Jarrett and Bubba the Love Sponge bickering. You could find nothing better to listen to than Bubba the Love Sponge. (laughs) Someone please explain this to me. This this is up there with... uh, uh, the fucking conversation we were having the other day about bad comedians. Will Ferrell. Oh, Will Ferrell's much funnier than Bubba. I agree. I All those people are much funnier than Bubba that you hated. Let me think about this. Actually, you know what? Of all those people, I'd rather watch all of them than listen to Bubba the Love Sponge, or mm. even have to see him again. Yeah. Just a, a wretched character. So, Bischoff met with Lashley without Crystal, and after all these weeks of wanting to quit... He walks in and tells Bischoff he wants to wrestle. So Bischoff says, I'll talk to Hulk and we'll talk to you again next week. This was bad. This was a good example of the the old TNA where this made absolutely fucking lutely no goddamn sense. Yeah, it, it'd be one thing. I, I They tried to tell a story here of how it was important to not let your woman run your life or whatever, but it's not like Chris was going behind Bobby's back. He was standing in the ring next to her as she declared he was too good for this and he was quitting. So this failed. What is what is with a shock jock? It's 2010. <laughs> people people are really shocked by anything that people say nowadays. I suppose Actually, so. the Haiti thing was pretty shocking, but I don't think that was shock jock shtick. I think that was just a dumb fuck. And regardless, did it make you want to listen to his show no. more? No. It makes me never want to see the guy as long as I live. The go-away heat. Like, what, what in... T- seriously... In 2010, what is the appeal of a shock jock? I can, I can I can understand in, like, the 90s. You know what I mean? The 90s were a very different time. It's 2010. It's a very different time now than it was in the 90s. How are shock jocks still employed? Who listens to them? Can someone explain this to me, please? Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. Or post it on the board. Someone explain to me the the the... What it is about Bubba that makes people want to listen to his program every day? Because I am in a I'm in a loss. Then we had uh, Hogan and Eric coming out. <laughs> actually, you skipped a Bubba segment. I actually hope a bunch of uh, of Bubba's fans are listening to this right now and they just quit the site. <laughs> like <laughs> like they're gonna boycott the site and it's gonna like hurt my pocketbook or something and I'm gonna go out of business. I I don't need you people here, quite frankly. Actually, I shouldn't even say that. So there was a historic, He's very angry right there, now. There everybody. was a historic segment here. Bubba the Love Sponge interviewed Scott Hall and Kevin uh, Scott Hall and Sean Waltman. This is the first time Scott Hall was sober on television since like the original Razor Ramon days. Yeah, he looks fine. He that his performance was fine. His content actually sucked when he said they had proven themselves a Genesis. They lost the match. He beat up a fan. Yeah. So I don't know what he was talking about here. It was fascinating that Hall was in fact more lucid than Waltman. Who he called Cheech. Told him to go light up another one. Yeah. So then we had uh, Hogan and Eric coming out, and Hogan did a promo, and some of the geeks tried a We Want Six Sides chant, and Hogan ignored him this time. Said he was tired of the clowns running around and acting like idiots, and said he wanted to see them wrestle, and he wanted to see it right now. And the crowd cheered, and so out came the band. And they were on the ramp. They didn't say a thing. They didn't do a thing. But they're the sight of them. Caused Hulk Hogan to fire them. Kicked him out of the building. Bubba the Love Sponge still employed, but they fired Hall, a sober Hall, and Waltman here on this thing. So they uh, they fake send him out of the building, and, and Nash tells him to, to leave, but he says, don't worry, guys, I'll, I'll make it right. He promised he would fix it. Mm-hmm. Then he ran his ha- fingers through his hair stressed. And then Bischoff fully ran out, and Bischoff told him, if you want to talk, we'll talk. So... Nasty boys had a match, 
In 2010, everyone. Speaking of in 2010. This match actually occurred. The Nasty, Nasty Boys against Kevin Nash and Eric Young. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, I was expecting complete disaster here. It was mostly okay. It was acceptable. There was one point where Brian Knobs ran into the corner, and it was funnier than any uh, cross-the-ring dropkick Tommy Dreamer ever did. I howled with laughter at Brian Knobs' turn to run. Other I than howled with laughter at Brian Knobs' spherical head. I have never seen a rounder head on a man. Even Clippy when he was a baby, and his head was oversized he, compared to his body. He did have a large head he as a young boy. He was never as round as the head that I saw on this, this, this guy here. Yes, so, although I, I will say the one time Nigel McGinnis ran across the ring in, in uh, not Ohio Valley, the sub-Ohio Valley group. HWA. That was it, yes. That may have been funnier. Yeah. But uh, anyway, Jerry Sags kicked out of Eric Young's elbow and then pinned him with a pump handle slam. So, again, sucks to not be Orlando Jordan or Val Venus or the Nasty Boys. We had Team 3D beating up the Nancys backstage with two unprotected chair shots to the head. They weren't the hardest chair shots I've ever seen, but I don't want to see any chair shots to the head. Plus, they immediately cut away. So this failed on every level. Two thumbs down. Speaking of failures, Mr. Anderson came out. Actually, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not the biggest Mr. Anderson fan in the world, but I loved this segment. Well, yes. Mr. Uh, Anderson comes out, and he cuts a promo, which actually was a... I was trying to figure out if this was just a great... Ironic heel promo, or or if he was just an idiot. But he, but come, he, he, he said comes, he was not going to talk. Everyone else was talking, but actions speak louder than words. And then he talked for like four more minutes. Yeah, he talked and talked and talked about how he was going to not talk, but act. Meanwhile, several minutes into this, they cut to a wide shot. And at the bottom of the screen, behind the ring, you just see an abyss, calmly mosey across the screen and into the ring. Yeah, Abyss <laughs> snuck into the ring and stood one foot behind Mr. Kennedy, and Mr. Kennedy didn't know he was there. Which oh. actually, normally I would make fun of this, but I fully believe that Mr. Kennedy is so into himself that he didn't know there was anyone else in the building except for him in his spotlight. So he's cutting this goofy promo, and meanwhile, Abyss is behind him doing the fucking greatest facial expressions yes. you've ever seen. This this was something Buster Keaton and Fatty Arbuckle would have appreciated. Yes. So he he rants and rants and rants, and finally Abyss taps him on the shoulder, and Kennedy turns around, and Abyss beats the piss out of him, and Kennedy bumped around like a madman and rolled outside, and I gave this segment two thumbs up. I this did write, was awesome. I did write Abyss was a star of stars here. They both were great. <laughs> they, it, this, this took it took two to tango here. I I, I, I when I. My failure reference to Mr. Anderson was out about the pay per view. I will concede that he was a, he was a success here. Not only that, but but. Mr. Anderson, let's be honest, he had some great lines. I don't know if it was it was irony as noted or or what, but he, he was sitting there talking about how he wanted to, actions would speak louder than words as he talked and talked and talked and, he, and talked. He, and by the way, he repeated that a few times. Yeah. So I, I, I'm sure it was intentional. And he also, and I don't know if this is intentional or not, but he was talking about his match with Abyss, and he actually called Abyss clumsy. Well, he is. Fucking awesome. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Kennedy calling someone else clumsy? <laughs> Give me a break. Hey, both. Mr. I would take Abyss in my gymnastics class before Kennedy, because the latter would kill himself at some point for sure. Abyss, I'm sure I could teach a flip to. Clumsy. And we had uh, Foley meeting with Eric, and uh, Eric was so confident that he kicked everybody out of the office for his meeting with Foley, including yeah. the cameraman. The, the, the implied message here was, everyone leave so I can kick Mick Foley's ass without the cameraman being here. I guess so. That was the implied message. Then we had AJ and Angle for the title. Angle beat the hell out of him early. Went for the Germans. AJ gave him a low blow. Got some heat for a while. Angle ended up making his big comeback as usual and went for the ankle lock. And AJ ended up reversing it. Clamped on the ankle lock. And as soon as he put it on, Earl Hebner rang the bell, gave AJ the belt, and ran for the hills. Fans chanted bullshit. Oh, it was. First off... You know what annoyed me most about this segment, to be honest with you? I can think of many things, so I'm curious as to which one annoyed you most. Okay, it was actually early on. Later, later we had Taz talking about maybe history repeated itself, but AJ puts him in the ankle lock. Earl Hebner rings the bell, runs for high heels, and it's very clear that Angle didn't submit. And the announcers are baffled. 
What happened? What happened here, they're asking. Okay? If TNA were a company that never acknowledged the existence of WWE, that would be fine. But they are always talking about WWE. In fact, Kurt Angle, after this was over, threatened to go back to the WWE. Those were his exact words. Okay? So, how could the announcers not know this was the Montreal screw job? You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. Shouldn't the reaction have been for them to groan? <laughs> not again. <laughs> they, they always talk about WWE. They're always comparing themselves to WWE. They're talking about Vince. And a Montreal screw job occurs right in front of their faces, and they have no idea what's going on. So they recreate it exactly, which is even stupider, because we're supposed to believe that, I don't know, are we supposed to believe this is real? And it, it was recreated exactly okay. as, as Montreal Hulk, occurred? Hulk came in ringside. Angle said, I'm going to WWE, I quit, and then he spat in Hulk Hogan's face. Yes. This came off like the most second-rate thing of all time. Because not only are they rehashing a 12-year-old Angle, I guess by calendar years, 13 years now, for the 8 millionth time that we've all seen it, but they're doing it at the exact same time when WWE actually is moving on. In WWE, this storyline, after a decade plus, is advancing. Yes. In TNA, they're repeating it. Yeah. Spot for spot. Yes. This makes them look like just a... Especially show, when, when Bishop parody. just did that interview talking about how he felt he was far more creative than Vince McMahon. Yes. Just not as successful. Well, <laughs> That was a great line. In this, in this fucking situation, you are not as creative as Vince McMahon, and you are also less successful. So you failed on both fronts here, buddy. Yes. So this was a, a... This was bullshit, everyone. And then... Then Taz goes, did we just see history repeat itself? Mm -hmm. You just now figured this out, you dumb fuck? <laughs> This wasn't patently obvious the moment it occurred that this was the Montreal fucking screw job in 2010. Yes. So, as the, the they go to commercial, they come back, the announcers are standing there befuddled. They show clips of Kurt Angle going crazy and throwing equipment around like Bret Hart did in Montreal. Mm -hmm. He should have made WWE with his fingers. And suddenly, Eric I wish he would have, and then everyone would have watched Raw on Monday. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> the raw rating is up by five tenths of a point. So then Eric Bischoff staggers out. He is bleeding from the head. He is selling a severe beating. And he gets in the ring. He takes a microphone and he says, Mick Foley, you're fired. And the show ends. So they <laughs> drowned out Kurt Angle quitting by firing Foley virtually simultaneously. Oh, yeah. The last ten minutes of the show was horrendous. I think maybe in the last five minutes of actual television. It was just a, a show that had been okay became hateable. So they way to go, guys. You know what they did? They reverted back to their old ways. They did. They, That's what they the, did in the final five minutes this, here. This goddamn company, no matter who comes in, no matter what fresh ideas they have, no matter what new faces they might bring with them, no matter how better they might be at pacing a television show, this company still finds a way to drag everyone down. The company is still TNA. It's still TNA wrestling, everyone. <laughs> it is still TNA, everybody. Got a text here from our buddy Mark a while ago. Oh, Mark, God, I bet you... Did you hear about the new ring? He did, actually. And it's funny, because he goes, oh, she's getting used to the other one. <laughs> so... He sent me a text, and uh, it just reads, Hogan is destroying TNA. The show is awful. Just fucking awful. So, there's a TNA fan for you, everybody. Plus, we have Ian, Ian now asking if, if Kurt Angle's really going to WWE. So, hopefully, their rating is up by five-tenths of a point on Monday, and I can laugh my ass off at this maybe, wackiness. Maybe, the, as long as they're recreating Angles, maybe they can recreate Angle or uh, Bischoff Pillman, and they'll actually give Kurt his release. Maybe they will do that. And they'll have to go to WWE. You know, I will throw a party if that happens. There, I can already see the problems here. I mean, the show is a better wrestling show, and it's a better TV show. I can't see the better wrestling show because the wrestling is not as good. Well, the wrestling, the wrestling sucked on the old Impact. Don't I mean? There were some better cruiserweight matches, but I mean, seriously, how many matches went a minute on a that lot. old show? A lot. It, it's a better television show the way it's put together, but again. Okay, so so apparently the idea is is it's going to split, and half the stars are going to side with Foley, and I guess Dixie, and Hogan maybe I don't know, or Bischoff. There's going to be two sides feuding with each other. It just seems like they're rushing into this, just rushing headlong into it. 
take your fucking time. Do you have to fire everybody on the same goddamn show? I mean, seriously, you fired Hall, Nash, Angle quit, and you fired Foley, all on the same show. You couldn't have spread this over four weeks? What are you going to do for the other three weeks leading up to the pay-per-view? It's just, they're rushing headlong into this, they're going to start the angle, they're going to rush through the angle, and they're going to be like, huh, hmm, right back where we started. So basically, it's it's exactly what we saw in WCW. I did. I, Which I, at least was doing better ratings than Impact. I avoided the spoilers, uh, just because I didn't care. And then, in the preview on the site today, did you write that or did Dave write that? Dave did. He had a line about the Impact lineup where he said, they taped several episodes of TV, it's unclear what's going to be on a show tonight. Mm-hmm. That means st- the, the elements of their storyline are so confusing, it's hard to put them in order. Mm-hmm. No good. To the back! All right, start on impact here, and don't bore me. Hulk Hogan or Nerd You Fisher. fucker! You have ADD, that was easy. So, Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff came down to the ring. Oh, now we get the excited event. The fans were dancing to Hulk Hogan's music, which was greatly entertaining. Uh, Hogan pretty much immediately called out Mick Foley. You will recall that last week we had seen Eric close the office door, then come out bleeding, and then fire Mick Foley. And uh, Hogan suspected something was up, was up I guess, because he had Foley out there. He said there was a lot of good things about Mick Foley, but also a lot of crazy things about him, but he thought somehow they could turn him into, to, uh, turn him into an asset. Eric said, wait a minute, this man put me into the hospital. Mick said, hey, I never laid a hand on you. You, He, he accused him of paying somebody to rough him up or even even mutilating himself, but he denied ever laying a hand on Eric. Hogan was then cut off by his own music, which happened a few times in the show. Basically, he told, them to, he told Mick Foley to get together with Eric and work it out or walk out. Yeah. So, basically, he wanted them to kiss up and make nice, but he was, putting, he was telling Mick especially that his job was on the line. Jared showed up with Bubba, and Bubba was begging him for something. I don't know what it was. I was just fascinated because Bubba the Love Sponge was wearing an Under Armour polo, which, first of all, why did they make those? And second of all, why was Bubba the Love Sponge wearing workout gear of any kind? Why was he on TV? Well, there's that. Christine interviewed Mr. Anderson. He said he wasn't on the show tonight, so he had to book himself, much like he had to do his own ring intros, and challenge anybody in the locker room for later. Prayed to God it was abyss. It wasn't. Then we had an awesome moment. Today said at the pay-per-view there would be an eight hard stud tournament. My eyes grew wide. My ears, I don't want to say they perked up because that would... Uh, that was other body parts. Eight hard stud tournament? Later, he said it again and I believe he said eight card stud. There's a graphic that read eight card stud tournament. Okay, first off, several questions. Why does every fucking tournament have to have a stupid ass name? Don't know. Why is there another tournament for a title shot when Samoa Joe and Lashley are both still owed title shots? Don't know. Eight hard stud? <laughs> I know this makes any sense. Why is there a Las Vegas theme to the graphic? Are they is this is the show in Vegas? I don't know, Vince. I don't think so. So we got a qualifier here. Nigel and Sean Morley. The best part about Sean Morley's return to the world of wrestling is that TNA keeps cutting to, you know, they keep cutting to camera shots of women who are supposed to be swooning over Val Venus, and they never are. They perhaps giggle, sometimes they sneer, and sometimes they are just sitting there. Yeah. But it's always funny. Nigel is a new woman named Chelsea who... Just deer in the headlights. No idea what she's doing. She's so forgettable, Brian. This is not the first time she's walked out, but you forgot her. Oh, I remember her. Yeah, it's I just the first time she had a name. Yeah. So they had a match. It was all right. And Desmond ended up hitting his Tower of London for the clean pin. So, again, if we... Someone needs to go through again and add up the wins and losses for everybody on the inner card. Because, again, yeah. everybody is like one and one, two and two, yeah. three and three. Nobody is going to get over at this rate. I was going through... This is off the top of my head, but in the past two or three weeks... Orlando Jordan beat the Pope. The Pope beat Desmond Wolf. Desmond Wolf beat Sean Morley, and he beat Chris Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> All right then. Match was fine. There was. They were also talking. I don't know if this is part of the tournament or something else entirely. But they were talking about instituting an official top ten ranking system, and talking about how important it would be for guys to move up and down the ladder. That's a. That'll I, be awesome the way they book. I was going to say. I, I applaud. I applaud them for ha- having uh, a great idea like this that will make wins and losses matter. I have zero faith they'll be able to pull it off and make it mean anything. Jared met with Ogan and Bischoff, 
And Eric wanted to know where his lawyer was, and Jared said, no, I don't want a lawyer, I just want to start out fresh. It's the same Jared, by the way, that was crying and ranting and raving about his company being taken over, blah, blah, blah. Now he's just like, okay, I'll start over at the bottom. He does change every week. Yeah. I think the Jeff Jarrett character may be insane. So he uh, agreed to lace up the boots, and Michelle was like, i got a great idea. Ken Anderson needs an opponent tonight. And Jeff was like, what, at the pay-per-view? And Michelle said, no, tonight. Jarrett was like, I haven't wrestled in seven months. And Bischoff said, too bad, lace him up. And then as he left, Hogan was kind of shocked and said that Eric was being awfully stiff. Back it down a notch, he said. Yeah. There's something so great about Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff as an on-screen pairing. Yes. They're, so, bo- they're both so cartoony, it's awesome. Because Bischoff is playing a heel and Hogan is playing a baby face. But right now they're getting along. But they are friends. Yeah. Kind of like us. Then we had uh, a replay of Montreal. Which I'm not sure which is Hogan, which is Bischoff there. Had not been addressed on the show yet. Well, me, I'm the natural heel and you're full of shit. That is a fascinating statement right there. <laughs> Let's move on. Rick was backstage. What, I'm not full of shit? Rick Flair and AJ Styles were looking at the handmade suits. They also had a hot blonde there. Uh, Rick wanted to make sure this blonde would bring some friends so he could have a party too. Uh, he asked her if he she wanted to go on the oldest ride with the longest line. Yeah. What a great human being this is. Actually, you'd be the I, you'd be the natural heel, and I'd be the one that was full of shit. Now that I think about it. Chris Daniels wrestled Hernandez. You don't want to analyze this. I, I don't pairing? at all. No, not not one part of me wants to discuss this. <laughs> Why? Chris Daniels wrestled Hernandez. Uh, Hernandez came out wearing a tank top and these new tag team championship belt, and I don't know what it was, but. Right, it may just be. It may have nothing to do with that. But he looked enormous in this getup. So, what are we even talking about? Where are we? Chris Daniels wrestled Hernandez. I was still busy trying to figure this whole thing out. I'll go for it. <laughs> I give up. Whatever you want to do. I was just wondering what. Uh, how did you see this pairing? Abbott and Costello. That's a much better fit than Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. <laughs> You're the one that brought that one up. Well, that. I was just trying to find some way to 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 label each of us. All right, one of them's old and crippled. One of them killed a company. <laughs> so who is who in this scenario here? Which one killed the company? <laughs> well, that's a good question. See? I say Eric Bischoff. I don't. I think it's an impossible discussion because I have nothing in common with either of those men. All right. That's, I was just bringing it up because you brought it up. You said, didn't you? I don't think you I did. You said this is like the two of us. I No, you said that. That was Brian Alvarez saying that. Did I? And the fact, by the way, that this <laughs> shitty discussion is taking place is proof we are nothing like them. They're entertaining. We suck. So which one has the bad memory? It's Bischoff. Well, there you go. We figured the whole thing out. I did bring that up now that I think about it. Huh. Well, go on. Hernandez pinned Daniels. He's the one guy, he and Morgan, I guess, are the only mid-card guys who actually get to win all the time. They wanted the tag, uh, the pay per view as a tag team. They destroyed the champions, left them laying, and won. And then Hernandez came out here. They had a little match. He pinned Daniels with the Dominator. He won. So I guess Hernandez and Morgan are going to be the breakout stars of the uh, mid card, which would be no surprise because they are big. Entering interview segment with the Nasty Boys and Team 3D, which they had geeks out there to make sure they didn't touch each other. And uh, they both basically cut promos on each other. Bubba. Is always in fine form when he finds a guy fatter than him. <laughs> I was trying to think of the, during the first part of this: has there ever been a fatter tag team match? I'm sure, the Natural Disasters, and uh, I'm sure another fat team. See, yeah, I was trying to think of if maybe the Dudley Boys wrestled the Headhunters somewhere. Anyway, this what's that noise? That was me adjusting the mic. So yeah, they battled back and forth. Devon was awesome. Bubba was fun. Sags didn't say a goddamn thing of any value. And Nobbs ranted and raved to the point I thought he was going to have a heart attack just screaming. Yeah. They're doing a fine job with this feud. Yeah, I... I, I but the match is going to be hideous. It is. Just <laughs> Well, you know what? Hideous. I had low hopes the last time the Nasty Boys wrestled, and it would... It was who did they wrestle that was passable? Kevin Nash and Eric Young. That was like a minute. Well, I This is a it tag to team a semi-main event match. Yeah. They're going to have to go like ten minutes. I don't disagree with that. I'm going to focus on the positive and say... I would, I really like this segment. These teams cutting passionate promos on each other about how all the asses they had kicked in the past and how they're going to kick each other's ass. Uh, and they were doing so in a very colorful and wacky and enjoyable manner. And 
I guess again, uh, I was going to say I enjoy, I've enjoyed every Nasty Boys segment, which I guess is not true, but their return has been much more positive than I would have guessed. We had Christy, who I think was wearing completely different makeup than she was 10 minutes earlier, which is what happens when you tape everything out of order. Interviewed the beautiful people about the match tonight and the return of Angelina Love, and they had nothing really to say. They don't like Angelina. They're going to prove they should be the knockout tag team champs the whole nine yards. They know Lacey is dumb. Mischoff met with Lashley and said he'd talk to Hogan. They looked over the roster and, well, you're fired. <laughs> this storyline is weak. This also reminds me of the Jared deal in that, and A. Tad's even mentioned this. He goes, Lashley spent like three weeks bitching about how he wanted to quit and get out of his contract. Then he gets fired and he flips his lid? Yeah. That makes no sense. No, it does not. He'll be better off in strike force anyway. So, another guy fired, by the way. Then we had Hamada and Kong and Tara against the beautiful people. It is never not amazing to see Ayako Hamada in the ring with Lacey Velvet Von Sky, Eric Madison I... Rain, and Lacey Von Eric. Yes. The, uh, they're not at her level. No. No, not They're close. horrendous. In fact, I'm watching this. I mean, it's not like this is breaking news, but the beautiful people are not good wrestlers. No. And that is one more reason it was stupid to not put Angelina Love back on the team. So Lacey ended up hitting Hamada with her pink dildo. Madison got the pin. And then heels attacked the baby faces, and Angelina made the save. Wow. Whew. I also want to know who decided to put Tara in full-length tights. Who Ter- decided to put Tara in the ring? Terrible plan. Why? Because her ass looks better than the short ones. <laughs> I so <laughs> I'll just move on here. Fitz, of all the girls in the ring, that's the ass you were staring at. I, have you seen? There were many fine asses in this ring. Have you ever watched Tara run the ropes? She's bad. And, Horrendous. And, and, I, and it's not because of six sides because they're gone. She, her running the ropes in this show, I did notice that was pretty atrocious. But it was lost among the beautiful people being atrocious themselves. Hogan met Maybe with she should join them. Earl and said, why'd you ring the bell? And Earl said, well, he tapped the mat. It was a tap out. And Hogan said, that's bullshit. He said, you did this once in 1997. You did it again last week. Didn't mention the six times he's done it in between as well. But wanted to know why. And Earl said, you want to know the truth? The truth is that Brett didn't screw Brett, Vince didn't screw Brett, I screwed Brett, just like I screwed Kurt, and I did it for the money. Flair and AJ paid me a lot of money, enough to make it worthwhile. And Hogan was appalled. He was heartbroken and devastated as he stared at Earl and softly said, You did it for the money? (laughs) Yeah. Couldn't believe this man he trusted had sold out for the almighty dollar. Sold out his integrity, his honor. So he suspended him. So he suspended him. So, Flair and AJ are backstage. Four girls showed up. Flair got all excited. It was time to party. AJ was acting like a mini Ric Flair, and it's like a Saturday Night Live sketch. It's a horrible parody. Then we had Bubba, Fat Bubba. Yeah, well, not I guess Bubba Ray. Fat. Yeah. Um, the, the radio guy. The useless Bubba. Told Foley it wasn't looking good, and Foley said he was confident that he and Bischoff would come out of their meeting tonight with a better understanding of each other. Too many segments, actually. Not as bad as it used to be, but still, there were segments on the show that they didn't need. Then Kurt came out an hour and, like, 15 minutes into the show after the big angle last week was he got fucked out of the title. So they finally... This should have been, like, number one top of the show. So he comes out and he talks about how disappointed he is and AJ screwing him and this sort of thing and says that Ric Flair is just using AJ and how he's going to win the hard stud tournament and this and that. And Hogan finally comes out and said that when Kurt came into his office a few minutes ago, he'd accused him of something he was not guilty of. He said he was a leader of TNA, functioned on a whole different level. And what happened That's last week... That's his favorite phrase, by the way. What? A whole other level. Yeah. He uses it to describe everything. Yeah. said what happened with Kurt spinning in his face, if that ever happened again, Kurt would be fired. And Kurt apologized for it, said he was wrong, and they shook hands, and that was the end of the segment. Well, it wasn't the end of the segment, but it was the end of Hogan's part in the segment. And I was just sitting here wondering, so let me get this straight. Hogan signed Angle and AJ to a rematch. Right. The ref fucks Kurt. Mm -hmm. The ref admits to it. Right. The ref gets sent home. Mm -hmm. 
So Hogan doesn't bother signing a rematch. Well, he signs because he, he he gives Kurt a chance to win it by winning four matches in a tournament. This made no sense. <laughs> and and by the way, Kurt was fine with this. So then Waltman and Hall attacked Kurt. Hogan was nowhere to be found. So seems to indicate that it might be collusion here, but that, I don't that, know. That is, of course, what, that's what they want you to think about everything. Yeah. They want you to they want you to suspect Hogan of being in on everything, and I'm guessing the, guessing in the end he won't be. But that's it's working fine and. Uh, in the meantime, we'll probably, I'm guessing we'll get Secret Angle versus Sean Waltman. And I'm fine with that. Saban, Shelley, and Kendrick versus Generation Me and Red. They had a uh, fun little match while it lasted. Yeah. story was Kendrick is a man on his own. He doesn't like listening to orders. So he didn't like teaming with his non-friends, I guess. Anyway, the guns set up for their finish on Red, but Kendrick rushed in, kicked him, cradled him for the pin. So, um, Which was interesting because... Especially with what followed, yeah. It's not setting up a title match now, because out came Rob Terry with his briefcase, and they basically demanded he give it to Doug Williams. Williams immediately pinned Red, so Doug Williams, a new ex-champion, and Rob was extremely upset about this, but didn't really do anything. He just he seethed. looked mean. He, he fumed. Yeah. Wow. Fully met with Bischoff. And told a long, lewd story, the gist of which was he would rather have the worst job you could imagine than work for Eric. Which, again, begs the question, why don't you just quit? Don't know. Why are you here talking about how you'd rather do anything in the world but work for Eric Bischoff? But you're still asking for a job, it appears. So, I guess, I don't know what was going on here, but Bischoff told him he needed to reconsider quitting, I guess. Because if he did, then Eric, I guess, was going to fire Borash in Abyss. Thought he already fired Borash. And I don't remember him firing Abyss, but I think he yelled at him last week. But anyway, and then he left the office and he went to talk with AJ and Flair. And Flair was going nuts, talking about how it was time to party for the next 30 days. And Bischoff explained that Flair had a great lawyer. That's why they were stuck with him, even though they didn't like him. And he said they better rethink the party plans, because in TNA, everybody needed to be ready 24-7. And uh, then he left. And I was sitting there thinking, what? kind of party is going on right here because for the last hour and a half i've seen flair aj and four women all standing around and going "Woo!" that's about it and that's it flair there's AJ no was drinks once in a while no they're all wearing all their clothes there's no music what a shitty party there's no 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 food no drink no music just six geeks really yeah so yes as far as rick flair party goes rick flair's party go, rick flair parties go jesus christ as far as Ric Flair parties go, this was on the lame end of the list. And then Mr. Anderson came out and did his deal. There was a remarkable edit. I don't know what happened, but Jared and Anderson had a match. Jared is super over. He, uh, Jared is a great baby face. Yeah. And coincidentally, his best matches are when he's doing the gimmick of he's coming back after a long layoff. <laughs> yes, they are. But I, I love Jeff Jarrett, pro wrestler. Well, I love Jeff Jarrett when he just does a wrestling match and there's no bullshit. Yes. So he came out, he did a babyface match. It was great. He used shoulder blocks and hip tosses and he dropped kick and the crowd was going crazy and my heart melted. And uh, finally they did a comeback and he escaped the mic check, was going to go for the stroke. Anderson gave him a low blow, small him for the pin. Fun match, good finish. Bischoff was cackling backstage. He wouldn't even let Jared have music when he came down to the ring. I like how the idea is that Jared is starting from the bottom and working his way up, but he was still in the main event of the show. <laughs> Shouldn't he be in the opener? But anyway, they uh, he cackled about that, and then ended up uh, show ended with uh, Anderson beating up and laying out Jared with the mic check, and then Bischoff said, it's going to be a long, hard climb to the top of my mountain. And I thought, between that and the eight hard stud tournament, this is... Taking a turn for the gay. Didn't want to use that word. Homo. It's taking a it's taking a queer turn. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's funny. That's double entendre. That uh, is your impact review, everybody. I give it a thumbs in the middle. It was uh, certainly better than all those Crash TV Russo shows that we've said, but still a lot of holes in it. Still a lot of questions that remain to be answered. Maybe they will be answered in the next couple weeks of tapings. But uh, yeah, thumbs in the middle. Tilted slightly up. Yeah, uh, going back over, it's one of those shows where it was over, I thought that was fun, and I went back over and thought, not really. My thumb's at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Good to know. Maybe about 9.30. Yeah. Somewhere yeah, in that area. I agree with your evaluation, though. It was, it was 
by impact standards, a raging thumbs up. Yeah. But now that now that the show is starting to become a better wrestling show, is a much but the, the now last now we're more critical of it because the, initially the, the, initially when you come off absolute bullshit mm-hmm. like we were getting with Vince Russo for years, you you watch a an Impact show that's not bullshit and it's like God that was the best Impact in years. Then after you've had those for about three weeks, then you can start going okay, we've settled into a groove. The shows are better. Now, let's look at what could be fixed. What's what's not great about the show? They, they have raised their own bar. They've raised their own bar. They've raised that's exactly they what's happened. They have taken the bar in fact to a whole other level. We used to we used to grade on a curve and now the the curve is has has it's uh, steeper. It's a little steeper or something. Or, I don't or know. Curvier. I'm not a math guy.